It all comes down to this. YD versus Hyannis, game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championships at McKeon Park. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to Arbrox Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Sammy O'Brien, Chris Morales, Gabe Sustick live as torrential rain took us a day off, but now back in McKeon Park on a sunny day with a packed crowd at McKeon Park for a situation for both teams, win or go home, with Devin Smeltzer on the mound for Hyannis. Yeah, this is really the end of it all. Game number 51 of the season. There's no more baseball after this. This is the final nine innings that any team on Cape Cod will play in the 2015 summer end for either YD or Hyannis. They're going to reach the pinnacle of Cape Cod. It's really uh, hoisting that title at the end of it for YD. This would be their second title in two years for Hyannis. They're on the verge of something that's been 24 years in the making, of course. The by far largest crowd that we've seen at McKeon Park this entire summer. Hey, I mean, probably in the past quarter century, there has been no crowd this big. And for Devin Smeltzer, things really rely on his shoulders, but he's been the ace of this staff for Hyannis this entire summer as the first pitch is underway. Smeltzer at the bell, fires in, first pitches away, as are we for strike one on Cole Billingsley, the leadoff for YD. Smeltzer sets once again. Readies and fires the 0-1 pitch, showing bunt there, gets over to Smeltzer, corrals it, gives over to Bobby Melly, who bobbles it in his glove as Cole Billingsley reaches on base. Yeah, and uh, not the way that you want to start things for Smeltzer. Not exactly the most solid throw over there to first base, as we'll wait to see what the official ruling is, of course, with Bobby Melly making his first defensive start at first base in nearly two months. You expected a little, you know, a bit of cobwebs with that, but for Smeltzer, got to settle down. Should have been out number one, but now trust your defense behind you course for YD they're going to look to strike early as they often do. We'll go through the rest of the lineup for YD up to bat now will be Tommy Edmond followed by Gio Brusa as it will officially go down as an error. After Brusa will be Donnie Walton. Smeltzer sets first pitch there but that's popped up into the air by Edmond. Rogers comes back but it's going to go out of play. Almost caught there by a fan barehanded. It'll be an 0-1 count on Edmond. Donnie Walton will be the cleanup man. Dallas Carroll Tyler Houston, Michael Donatio, Josh Vidalis, and finally Nathan Rodriguez, the catcher in the nine spot for the YD Red Sox. Yeah, nothing really changes for YD. Of course, they're strutting out the same lineup that they've been for the past two games. As Smelton's going to fire back over to Melly, getting up safely will be Billingsley. As for Devin Smelts on the mound during the regular season, a 4-3 record, a 3.48 ERA. He sets once again, continues to stare over at first base, and Cole Billingsley decides to fire away. Misses upstairs for a 1-1 count to Edmund. Yeah, for Smeltzer, he's only faced YD one other time, and that was at YD on July 4th. Of course, he opposed Ricky Thomas in that start. It was a 7-0 victory for YD, of course. For Smeltzer on the mound, he only gave up two earned runs, so that big drubbing was not because of him. The 1-1 line, but right into the glove of Tristan Hildebrandt at short. He gets the first out against YD. And that's a big out to get it for Tristan Hildebrand. Of course, for Devin Smeltzer, what you want to do in this start is limit as much contact as you can. Of course, there is a base runner on first base. That was on your shoulders. But you got to have a short memory in the game of baseball. There's a very good defense behind Smeltzer on this start. And, of course, with everything riding, defense is going to have to play premier after that one error. Wind is slightly gusting out to center field, as we can see from the American flag over there into the harbor. Smeltzer continues to stare over at Billingsley at first base as Gio Brusa awaits the first pitch. Smeltzer deals, but it's upstairs for ball one. Yeah, and that's already a better start there for Tristan Hildebrand over at shortstop. The Harbor Hawks seem to have everything hit over their heads in the last game, the loss at YD just a couple days ago, so that's already better to see from, from the defense. Smeltzer sets the 1-0 to Brusa. Rocks that one out into left field. Drops right in front of Jake Knoll. And two men aboard for YD with one out. Yeah, and if you're YD, this is exactly the way that you want to start. You look at their last start against the Hyannis Harbor Rocks at, at Red Wilson Field at uh, DY High School, and they scored four runs in that first inning, mostly due in part to Donnie Walton, who's now in the right-handed batter's box. He had a three-run home run in that inning for YD, they kind of want to start the same exact way. For Smelter, that's only the first hit you give up. And, of course, it's to a switch-hitting all-star in Gio Brusa. So no harm, no foul. You just can't allow those runs to come in. 
Smelter sets once again, fires the first pitch into Walton, gets a shop chopper over to Hildebrand who misses it in his glove, and now it's a bases loaded situation early in the first. And for Hildebrand, tried to backhand that one, but he overran the baseball, and that's why it kind of hit off of his wrist. This one's gonna be an interesting call as well, but now for YD, perfect storm. You got bases loaded against one of the better pitchers as manager Gassman immediately gonna come out and talk to everyone here as that's gonna go down as the second error defensively for Hyannis in this inning with only one out recorded. That is not the way that you wanna start this game three with the championship on the line. As manager Gassman goes and talks to his infield, will give the defense for Hyannis. Jake Rogers behind home play, Colby Bortles at third, Tristan Hildebrand as we mentioned at short, Ryan Burke will be at second, Bobby Melly at first, Jake Knoll in left field, Corey Bird in center, and Austin Hayes in right. As Dallas Carroll stepping to the right-handed batter's box, and he had a day to remember yesterday, went four for four in the 9-3 win that YD had at Red Wilson Field to force this game three. Smeltzer sets. First pitch into Carroll. Slightly chops that one over to Melly. He's just gonna take it himself at first. No play at home as YD strikes first in the top of the first inning. And the question coming into this ball game was, how would Bobby Melly play over at first base? Of course, with a lot of speed down the third base side of things in Cole Billingsley, he comes around to score, no throw from uh, Melly, but a nice job for him not to force the issue. Hyannis has had way too many errors in this playoffs, forcing issues, you throw it home, and you get nobody out, that's not what you want. Melly does the safe thing, gets an out, you do give up a run, however. Tyler Houston steps in. Runners on third and second for YD with two outs. First pitch from Smeltzer gets in there for strike one on Houston. Yeah, and I think that's a smart play for Bobby Melly over at first base. He did look up to throw home and just saw that the runner coming over from third was coming in a little too hot, so decides to get the safe out over at first base. The 0-1 to Houston, who shows bunt over to Colby Bortles, scoops it up in his glove, fires over to Melly in time to get Tyler Houston out at first and keeps one, only one run on the board as we get to the bottom of the first with YD up one nothing. Hey, for the YD Red Sox, you'll take that run any way that you can get it. Any early lead that they can have with the man on the mound and Brandon Bailey from Gonzaga. The last time that he played high Hyannis, it wasn't exactly a great start. He gave up four earned runs on only five hits, or rather five hits, two earned runs, but there was a lot of errors defensively behind him. But for Bailey, his last start out against the Orleans Firebirds struggled. Five innings pitched, four earned runs on those five hits. He managed to get four strikeouts, but the thing with Bailey is the fact that he hasn't gotten a lot of run support from his team. His five losses combined, the YD Red Sox have combined in those five games four total runs. He already got one in this ball game, and according to all rumors, Brandon Bailey might only tow the rubber for about four, maybe five innings before a bullpen change made by manager Pickler. For the Harbor Hawks, it's very simple. Score and score early against Bailey. As four Highness will go through their lineup now, Corey Bird will be leading off, followed by Austin Hayes, Bobby Melly, Blake Tiberi, the DH, in the cleanup spot, Jake Knoll, Colby Bortles, Jake Rogers, Ryan Burke, and Tristan Hildebrandt. Nice. Yes. Bobby Melly will get set on the mound here. Yeah, this is uh, gonna be an interesting go around of things here for Hyannis. They were blanked really by Ricky Thomas. They were able to score three runs off of him, but for Ricky Thomas, one of the better starters for the YD Red Sox and on Cape Cod, really shut down Hyannis as they didn't really get too much offense going. But now against Bailey, someone who's been pretty inconsistent on the summer, two and five record, a 3.50 ERA. He has given up 38 hits, strike to walkout ratio, 36 Ks, 13 walks, and batters are hitting 240 against him. Of course, for Hyannis, they lost a little bit of that fire that they had in game one, but of course, returning to McKeon Park might re-spark that energy. The last time that we saw them down by one, they immediately came back to score. It's going to be on the offense today, at least in order to cut this deficit early on. As Corey Bird gets ready to step in here for Hyannis, they already trail one nothing in the bottom of the first inning in game three. And for Bird, yesterday struggled as did many of the Harbrocks against Ricky Thomas, went 0 for 4. First time he hasn't recorded a hit with Hyannis since July 24th at Bourne. Yeah, this is an offense that was just absolutely unstoppable for the first two rounds of the playoffs. And since they've hit YD, though, they did put up eight runs in the first game. A lot of those were off of defensive mistakes from this YD defense. So not a lot of hits were going in that game. So they'll have to turn it around in this game if they want to get something going, already having a 1-0 hole. Birds 
steps in now. Bailey at the ready. First pitch into Bird. Fastball upstairs for ball one. As the crowd is now starting to slowly sneak into the outfield, the space that there is out there, mostly near the right field and center field walls. The 1-0 -oh into Bird. Fastball just catches the outer half for a 1-1 one -one count. Yeah, and when you talk about how big this crowd is, it's going to play a factor at certain points in the game, no doubt, for Hyannis. A lot more fans in the YD. Uh, Red Sox fans down the first base side of things, but make no mistake, YD came out today. The 1-1 one -one to Bird. Hits a small flare out into center field. Getting into that one is Billingsley for the first out. And we'll set the defense for the YD Red Sox. Brandon Bailey on the mound. Nathan Rodriguez returns to the starting lineup after being scratched in game two at Red Wilson Field. The catcher from Arkansas will call all the pitches for Bailey. Dallas Carroll over at first base defensively. Tommy Edmond, the Stanford Cardinal, the all-star. Uh, man, second base, Donnie Walton from Oklahoma State at short. Josh Vidalis moves to third base. And left to right in the outfield, Mike Donatio, Cole Billingsley, and Tyler Houston. As Austin Hayes now steps into face against Bailey. Bailey sets and fires. First pitch in, breaking, catches the outside of Hayes for strike one. And for Brandon Bailey early on in the start, really utilize that breaking ball to keep batters off balance. Of course, you can imagine that this top of the order is really going to try and do some damage. Austin Hayes being probably the biggest catalyst of offense if he can get on. The 0-1 into Hayes. Misses there outside for a 1-1 count. As Austin Hayes coming in today, today with a six-game hitting streak for Hyannis. Needs that speed on the base immediately as they trail by one. The 1-1 one, one into Hayes. It's that one out into center field. Moving is Billingsley, and he'll make the play for the second out. Dan for Hayes just misconnecting on that breaking pitch by about an inch or so. If he really connected with that fat part of the bat, would have drove it pretty far out into left center field. But you got to credit Cole Billingsley. Seems to have a little bit of extra pep in his step. At least early on in this ball game, he's going to man center field defensively. He was the run that came around to score. Very quick, very speedy. As now Bobby Melly will step in here with two outs in the bottom of the first inning. Bailey at the ready, first pitch into Melly. Fastball down low for ball one. As I just two quick outs all to center field area. Unable to respond immediately back to what YD did in the top of the first. The 1-0 -oh into Melly, that one misses outside as well for a 2-0 count. Yeah, when you talk about someone like Bobby Melly, someone who's really been struggling specifically in the first two games of this championship series to come back home in his hometown in front of his friends and family in game three of the championship, you got to imagine that maybe the stars are aligning for Melly to have himself a big day. The 2-0 into Melly. That one just reaches the lower corner for the first strike. I mean, we're talking about a kid who was a former Hyannis bat boy, someone who's Really lived and breathed Hyannis for the last three summers. He's made five different appearances after coming back and leaving and coming back. But, of course, for Melly, he's got to connect here against Bailey, who's trying to keep him off balance with those breaking pitches. The 2-1 into Melly. Fastball misses outside by Bailey for a 3-1 count. As Bailey seems to be having issues so far, at least with his fastball, trying to hit his spots as Melly steps in. 3-1 count now, as you can still hear a little bit of the YD crowd just trying to Keep Bailey in it, even with a 3-1 count to Melly. As Bailey readies, fires into Melly. Now he's going to pop that one into the infield. As calling everyone off will be Donnie Walton right near the grass, and he makes the play for the final out as Hyannis goes down 1-2-3 in the top of the first. We head to the second inning. YD, a 1-0 lead in game three of the championship series. You're listening to Arbox Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Urgent care is now available at Cape Cod Healthcare's Stoneman Outpatient Center on Route 130 in Sandwich and at Fontaine Outpatient Center on Long Pond Drive in Harwich. Open after hours and weekends, no referral needed. Staffed by ER physicians. Learn more at capecodhealth.org backslash urgent care.
Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen. Arbor Rocks Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. YD already a 1-0 lead in the top of the second inning from McKeon Park. As coming up to bat will be Michael Donatio for YD. First pitch from Smelter, and that one's lined out of play right into the front section there by the hill on the left field side. It'll be an 0-1 count on Donatio. As Smelter and... The Harbrox defense came a little bit undone in that first inning alone. Already two errors, only one hit recorded for YD and one run. The 0-1 into Donatio misses outside by Smeltzer for a 1-1 count. Yeah, that throwing error over to first base by Devin Smeltzer kind of came back to haunt him a little bit. You do have that run on the board, but now for Smeltzer, there's nowhere you can go but up. This defense has to play cleaner in this game. The 1-1, that one gets in there on the lower corner of Donatio for a 1-2 count. And the way for Smelter to help out his defense is by pitching effectively, utilizing that breaking ball, especially to those left-handed hitters like Donatio. Smelter, the one-two count to Donatio, gets a chopper over there to Hildebrandt, has to scoop it and fire over, over his shoulder. That one's going to miss Bobby Melly, and it's going to roll over near the fence as is going to get to second. Yeah, and immediately, this is really not looking good. Of course, for Hildebrandt, that was... A very tough play for him to make. He was ranging over to his right, and then he had to throw across his body. That is the third error defensively in one inning of play here at McKeon Park. Don't understand it. This is not the way that you're supposed to play in game three. As now, Josh Fidalis will step in. As it will go down as a base hit, but an error on the throw. This is how Michael Donatio will end up over at second base, another runner in scoring position for YD for Josh Vidalis. Smeltz is going to check back over to Donatio. No one even really near him. As Burke and Hildebrand are both playing close. Bortles playing close to the infield grass as Melly's in a normal position. Smeltzer at the ready once again. Checks over at second. First pitch showing bunt there was Vidalis. As not sure if he did pull back in time. Oh, waiting the count from the home plate up there. It will go down as ball one as it looked like Vidalis might have just pulled it back in time. As Vidalis now steps in once again against Smelter. Still hearing a little bit from the YD crowd to help their t players out. 1-0 showing bunt again. This time gets it to go over to Bortles. And he fires over there to Ryan Burke. At first base as Bobby Melly ducked and covered, trying to go for the bunt as well. One out, but Michael Donatio moves to third. Yeah, and if you're YD, this is exactly how you wrote it up. Play some small ball. You're already up by a run. If you can get another run of insurance in this inning, it's only going to help you further on in this ball game. Of course, with Nathan Rodriguez, he only has three hits so far in these playoffs with one out in this second inning for Smeltzer. This is the guy you got to get because behind him is the top of the order. For Smeltzer, work your way out of this batter, and then it sets you up in a situation with two outs, makes it a lot easier than allowing a run with only one out. Smeltzer's going to reset on the mound with Rodriguez coming up to bat. And Smeltzer finally sets. First pitch into Rodriguez, just gets a piece of that one as it goes foul near the YD bullpen for strike one. Credit YD, they're aggressive for Rodriguez. Swung at the first pitch he saw, understood it was more than likely going to be a fastball right down the heart of the plate. That's the best type of pitch to hit. Now for Smeltzer, with an 0-1 count, you work yourself ahead. You can go into your breaking pitches a little bit more where he tends to keep batters off balance. Smeltzer at the ready once again. The 0-1 into Rodriguez, but that went outside to Rogers. Looked like a possible pitch to burn there. Just checking up on Donatio. It'll be a 1-1 count to Nathan Rodriguez, who so far in these playoffs only three hits to go in these playoffs. Has no runs or RBIs as well, but has five strikeouts. Smelts with a 1-1 into Rodriguez. Gets a slight chopper over to Rodgers, who corrals it. Fires over to Melly in time to get the second out as Donati will have to stay at third base. Yeah, and that's a big out to get. Good job defensively there by Bobby Melly. Made the play really nicely, and obviously the arm from Jake Rogers behind the plate was able to get it there in time and hold the runner at third at bay. Didn't technically look like an actual try bunt there. Didn't work out either way you look at it. As Cole Billingsley will now step in, leading off in his second at bat. He did score the first run for YD in that first inning. And the first pitch from Smeltzer, and that one just fouled back at the top of the bat by Billingsley behind home plate. 
for a strike one. And you're noticing here, two straight batters swinging at the first pitch they see from Smeltzer. Clearly the scouting report by manager Pickler is be aggressive early, get Smeltzer out of this game. The one thing that works in the favor of Hyannis is they have a full bullpen for today, but you're seeing the aggressiveness by YD. The 0-1 breaking gets in there, but just chopped foul once again by Billingsley. Now an 0-2 count. And out for Smeltzer, this is exactly where you want him. 0-2 count, two outs. You can really utilize any pitch you want. For Rodgers, he's going to call up something pretty nifty here. For Smeltzer, you just got to hit your spot for strike three. Denadio over at third base, two outs. Smeltzer the 0-2 pitch, swing and a miss there. Rodgers loses it, corrals it in his glove and fires over to Bobby Melly to record the final out of the inning as Smeltzer had to deal with the man on third base but leaves him stranded. We head to the bottom of the second. YD still up 1-0. Great job for Smeltzer to get his way out of that inning. You induce a little dribbler down in front of Jake Rogers. He corrals it, fires over to first base, and then you get yourself a strikeout as well. You help yourself out on the mound. That's exactly what you want to do. And more importantly, you leave that runner stranded 90 feet away over at third base. As now Brandon Bailey will come in for his second inning of work. He went 1-2-3 in his first inning. This time he'll have to face the four, five, and six guys, Blake Tiberi, Jake Knoll, and Colby Bortles. Four highness, a lot of power in those three bats. Yeah, a lot of power. Jake Knoll has been one of the hottest hitters in this series, going three for seven so far with two runs, having scored himself. Uh, any way you put it, this offense really needs to get going. We're pretty much blanketed, minus a few runs off of Ricky Thomas. And then even the runs that they scored in the first game, like we said, defensive errors were the reason that they were being plated. So really... What needs to happen in this game is the offense from the Bourne series and from the Katuit series really needs to come back. As Tiberi will get said so far, the numbers on Tiberi in these playoffs. As he waits, batting 278, has five hits and five runs as well, along with one RBI so far for Tiberi. As for him, on a four game hitting and run streak as well for Hyannis, and they're going to need him in a spot like this leading off against Bailey. Well, what better of a spot to have him in? Of course, if he has a four-game run streak, this is the perfect spot for him to be in. Lead-off position in the second inning. You're trailing by one. you got to tie the ball game up at least in order to shift momentum back on your side. Momentum's going to be a huge thing in this game three, considering how many fans are here for both clubs. For YD, you have the momentum now. Tiberi can change that with this at bat. First pitch into Tiberi. That one's upstairs breaking. Tried to get down there was Bailey for a 1-0 count. And the thing that works in Tiberi's favor is he, A, works counts, and B, he has a lot of support behind him. Noel has some power. Bortles has been looking good as well. The 1-0 into Tiberi gets that popped up into the air. Closing out into the outfield, though, as now Michael Donatio will call off Walton, who's coming in for the first out. And for Brandon Bailey, you really can't ask yourself or your defense for a better start. I mean, you're inducing four straight pop-outs in the first four batters that you face, of course, for Hyannis, you got to make some solid contact on this kid, but credit to Bulldog from Gonzaga. He's really working so far early on. As now Jake Knoll will step in as with Tiberi going down on a pop-out. One out, bottom of the second inning, a one nothing lead for the YD Red Sox. First pitch from Bailey. Knoll tries to get into that one, but it gets fouled behind home plate. And Knoll was just... A little bit too far ahead in his swing. A solid breaking ball from Bailey, just switching things up. Of course, for pitchers, that's really the name of the game, keeping batters off balance. And for Noel, he got caught in that situation. Now you're down 0-1. For Noel, he's one of the more excited guys coming into this game three. Really wants to win, and he wants to really leave his mark here at McKean in game three. The 0-1 into Noel. Gets that slight chopper over to Josh Vidalis. He's going to fire over to Dallas Carroll at first as it just went fair on the third base side for the second out. Yeah, and you can see that Bailey's really working here, inducing ground balls, pop outs. He's retired the first five batters that he's faced. Of course, the first time around against a pitcher is the hardest, but for Hyannis, really hitting themselves into these situations, not really waiting on their pitches. As now Colby Bortles will step in against Brandon Bailey. Bortles, as we mentioned, will be at third base today. As first pitch from Barry down low for ball one. So far for Bortles, has only been in four games so far, nine at bat, but he has three hits, a double, a run, and four RBIs with those at bats. The 1-0, that one gets just the lower half by Bailey for a 1-1 count. 
And if you're Bailey, that's the perfect place to throw that pitch. Bortles cannot get his bat around, at least when it's in on his hands like that. A breaking ball, solid in that part of the zone, perfect place for Bailey to throw strike one. Bailey sets once again. The 1-1 one -one pitch into Bortles. He just gets a piece of it but goes foul for a 1-2 count. And then to switch up that second pitch with the third pitch that he threw, a fastball right over the heart of the plate, really challenging Bortles, switching up the velocity. You can really see the zip on the ball that Bailey throws, and now Bortles quickly down 1-2. and two. Bailey sets once again a 1-2 count. Bortles awaits. The pitch is away, but it's down low to Bortles for a 2-2 two -two count. As Bortles sticking in this at bat knows the scenario that his team is already in, down one nothing in a monster crowd at McKeon Park. He awaits the 2-2 for Brandon Bailey. As he delivers, Bortles swings and a miss at the breaking pitch down low from Bailey for the final out as Brandon Bailey has retired the first six guys he's seen against Hyannis. As we head to the third inning, YD still a one nothing lead. You're listening to Arbrox Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Chatham Bars and Resort and Spa is the perfect blend of fun and excitement, a proud member of the leading hotels of the world. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to Arbrox Baseball and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Sammy O'Brien, Chris Morales, Gabe Sustick live at McKeon Park. Top of the third inning with YG a 1-0 lead. As Smeltzer at the ready on the mound. First pitch into Tommy Edmond, breaking on the outer half for strike one. As Hyannis is trying to find their offense so far, Smeltzer's going to have to continue to work on the mound diligently with YG already a 1-0 lead. The 0-1, but that one inside to Edmund for a 1-1 count. As Smeltzer did have an issue with Donatio over at third base in the second inning, but he left him stranded, now looking to have a first clean inning. The 1-1 into Edmund, who pops it up into the air. Rogers is moving back towards the netting, but it's going to go into the YD crowd for a 1-2 count. Yeah, for Smeltzer now, getting a clean inning, as you mentioned, Gabe, it's probably... The most imperative thing that he can do, not allowing a base runner, not having to work from the stretch for Smelter. Very deadly when he works from that windup, kind of fools batters with his off speed and his velocity. Utilizes that slider very, very well. If he can paint that into different corners, really for Smelter, rack up and continue to rack up strikeouts in this ballgame. That's going to pick up momentum and that's going to get you in your groove. The 1 2 into Edmund, and he just gets a piece of that defending himself on the plate there. For a 1-2 count, looks like he actually swung and missed it there, and he'll be for out number one. Yeah, as that actually, he got hit by the pitch, did Edmund, but he swung through. That, again, goes to show you how deadly that slider is. Even throwing it against right-handed batters who can see it coming out of the hand, fooled Edmund, although it hit him, went around with the swing. He's out regardless for out number one. The first strikeout for Smeltzer of the day, as now he'll face Gio Brusa, the DH. Yes. Smeltzer at the ready, fires that first pitch in near the toes of Brusa for ball one. That's for Gio Brusa so far. Stairs on in. The 1 0 dealt by Smeltzer. That one gets over to Bortles, but foul on the third base side for a 1 1 count. Yeah, now for Smeltzer on the mound. 
technically you've retired the last four that you've seen, of course, for Vidal's laid down a sacrifice. So, so officially it'll go down as three straight retired. But for Smeltzer, again, find yourself in that groove. We know how good he can be when he finds it. The 1-1 one, one breaking pitch just catches the outer half. A nasty breaking pitch by Smeltzer to put Bruce on a 1-2 count. There's that slider for Gio. Bruce couldn't really touch it, worked his way out, and then back in over the strike zone. Work yourself ahead with a 1-2 count. The 1-2 into Bruce, a hard hit, and it's going to get into the gap out in left field. As just missing, there was Hildebrandt ranging over once again from second base over to third, and Bruce aboard with one out. And for Hildebrand, you're having yourself a tough day in the early goings. Already two errors defensively. Coming into this game, he only had two errors in the playoffs. So we've already doubled that. And now ranging and movement is a little bit of a question mark. He nearly had that one, but just could not get it. As now Donnie Walton will step into the right-handed batter's box. He has Gio Brusa over at first with a 1-0 lead. One out in the top of the third. First pitch by Smeltzer, fastball misses inside for ball one. As slowly the crowd continues to grow at McKeon Park, more and more people are ranging into the outfield area. All watching, depending on if you're a YD or a Hyannis fan. The 1-0 pitch, that one misses down low for a 2-0 count to Walton. Yeah, and this has got to play some sort of a factor for the players. I mean, of course, you kind of get tunnel vision when you're on the diamond. You kind of just focus in on what you're supposed to do, what your job is. But, of course, when you go into the dugouts, you got to notice that the entire center field wall is just lined with fans. I mean, it's got to play a factor. The 2-0 from Smeltzer, swing and a miss by Walton for strike one as he shakes his head from the nice pitch from Smeltzer inside. But for Smelter, of course, your back is to those fans out in center field. All you can see is the crowd right in front of you. And even then, Smelter's really just playing pitch and catch with Rodgers, really working on that breaking pitch. The 2-1 into Walton just gets a piece of that one as well inside. And Smelter gets it back to a 2-2 count. Yeah. yeah. After you, Sammy. And when you talk about all that he's been through this summer as a pitcher, did throw that no-hitter earlier in the year, also was named the co-MVP of the All-Star game. It seems like all these people probably aren't going to phase him too much. Walton steps back in with a 2-2 count from Smeltzer. Gio Brusa over at first base. Smeltzer sets and fires in, and just getting a piece of that once again is Walton. Yeah, and for Smeltzer, as you mentioned, game working his way back into this 2-2 count. Fell early 2-0, came back 2-2, and then you go in with that slider once again, throwing it outside in on the hands of Walton, almost forcing him to swing at it. For Smeltzer, that's his put-out pitch. That's his bread and butter. And if he can get out number two, this is a huge at-bat. The 2-2 two -two to Walton. Lines that one out into right field. Hayes is moving back near the warning track, but makes the play for the second out. Yeah, not exactly the way that you wanted to see Hayes track that ball down, but he did just enough in order to corral it. Of course, with the sun directly in his line of sight to our left here in the broadcast booth, it's really shining right on Austin Hayes out in right field. As the game progresses and the sun continues to set, that won't be too much of a factor. So early on for Smelter, limit those fly balls, especially to center and to right, and you'll have yourself a pretty good day as Noel's completely out in shadow out in left. As he deals the first pitch. That one gets in there on the lower corner to Dallas Carroll, who grounded out to first base, but was able to score the first run in Cole Billingsley in that first inning. Smeltzer sets with Brusa over at first base. Continues to stare on. 0-1 pitch now into Carroll. Breaking once again. Catches the lower corner for an 0-2 count. Yeah, and Smeltzer really utilizing those off-speed pitches. That wasn't the slider, but you can kind of see a little changeup that Smeltzer's been working on. Now you work yourself ahead 0-2 against really the one batter in YD's lineup who has been red hot. Smeltzer sets at the belt once again. Stares over at first. The 0-2 into Carroll. That one misses too much inside for a 1-2 count. Perfect pitch to throw, just wasn't enough over the heart of the plate for Smeltzer. Again, that slider is really where he makes, or will make all of his money eventually one day. But for Smeltzer, just a little bit too far inside, working a little bit more towards the outside part of the plate, and you got yourself something. Two outs, top of the third, 1-2 pitch. Get that one over to Hildebrand, diving and misses it as it goes into center field. Corey Bird will retrieve it, and two men aboard for YD. Yeah, and the thing for YD in this 
scenario right now. For Gio Brusa had a one-two count, and Dallas Carroll had exactly the same thing, and you're still getting off singles. This is exactly what they did in game two over at Red Wilson Field, forcing the issue, really being aggressive with two strikes, and it's worked to their advantage for Smeltzer. This is now the third straight inning where you've allowed at least one base runner in scoring position. You got two outs. Focus on the batter. Let the defense do the rest. Uh, Smeltzer. Sets and fires the first pitch into Tyler Houston, who lines it right past Colby Bortles out to Jake Knoll. He's going to corral it. Fire over into the catcher spot, and Knoll, who's going to make the tag. Jake Knoll from Jake Rogers makes the tag on Gio Brusa to get the final out of the inning. What an amazing play by Jake Knoll. Getting his first start in left field just this summer. He's a second baseman normally. Amazing throw in. Jake Rogers laying down the tag. Perfect to get out of that inning. The connection of the Jake strikes, and they keep it a one nothing game. Hyannis heads to the bottom of the third. Yeah, and for Hyannis, this is really sort of a momentum shifter. That's the second straight inning that you allow Base runners in scoring position, but none of them come around to score. And an exciting play like that from Jake Knoll, who doesn't exactly have the best arm out in left field. Manager Pickler challenged him. He said, all right, Knoll, fire this kid out at home. And he did exactly that. An even better job for Rodgers to block the plate with his body and lay down the tag for out number three. Now the objective switches. Offense, you got a little bit of momentum on your side. Really start connecting on... Bailey on the mound. He's really worked his way in and out of two innings, completely unscathed, hasn't allowed a base runner yet in this ball game. You allow one base runner, see Bailey work from the stretch, and I guarantee you, you might see some chinks in the armor and he might fall apart. It's still only a one nothing game. YD is not that far ahead, and Hyannis with a couple of hits, a couple base runners here, can really get their way going offensively in this game. As for Hyannis, it will be Jake Rogers leading off followed by Ryan Burke and Tristan Hildebrand for INS against Brandon Bailey, who has retired the first six batters he has seen. Almost all of them have been flyouts, only one ground out and a strikeout. As Hyannis will look to change that here, YD still leading 1-0. Yeah, and earlier in the playoffs, 7-8-9 in the order really was the catalyst of offense. And then the top of the order kind of took their form as well right afterwards. And it started off with Jake Rogers, who really caught fire as soon as he was selected as an all-star in the regular season. That momentum transferred over into the playoffs. And now perhaps in his first at-bat here, especially after making that great defensive play, you might see momentum start shifting in this third inning. It all really starts with a base runner. As Rodgers awaits the first pitch from Brandon Bailey, and he gets right into that one, over into left field, moving back is the left fielder, Donadio, who makes the play at the warning track, continuing to run for the first out. Yeah, it looked like for a second that Rodgers might have clipped enough of that one in order to let it fall somewhere in the left field, but you got to credit the speed by the YD outfielders right now. Donadio especially got on his horse, tracked that ball beautifully, and especially when you consider the fact that the ball went from sunlight into the shade, you kind of have to factor in that movement in between sunlight and shade, and Donadio did it perfectly for out one. Brian Burke will now step into the left-handed batter's box with Bailey looking very good on the mound. Retired seven straight. First pitch is outside to Burke for ball one. Yeah, and these balls are being hit really well. They're just happen to be hitting exactly where the YD defenders are at some point in this game. Hopefully they'll get where the YD uh, defense isn't and they could start getting some hits. The 1-0 into Burke. That one just catches the upper corner for a 1-1 count. And credit Bailey, of course, as soon as he falls behind 1-0 in a count, immediately fires back with a strike. So for Bailey, doesn't really want to find inconsistencies on the mound. He hasn't yet through seven batters. The 1-1 to Burke gets that one, but fouls it right back into the netting for a 1-2 count. So far for Ryan Burke, had caught fire early on in these playoffs. Right now he stands with eight hits, six runs, two home runs, and six RBIs. Looking to do something after Rodgers had a loud line out over to left field. The 1-2 into Burke, swinging a miss there as it was corralled by Rodriguez, tags Burke out for the second out of the inning. And the offense really struggling here, of course. Hyannis has really been doing a good job with two outs offensively. But of course for Brandon Bailey, he's dealing right now. There's no other way around it. Utilizing that fastball and a nasty breaking ball that he throws. The righty from Gonzaga impressing so far as he's perfect through eight. Batters, that is. Wouldn't want to get that one confused there, Chris. No, that would be a problem. Two outs now in the bottom of the third inning. As Hildebrand steps in, first pitch from Bailey. Fastball gets in there for strike one. As, but 
No doubt for Brandon Bailey has come to play today in this game three in front of a large crowd. As Hildebrandt awaits in the final spot in the lineup. As the 0-1 pitch. That breaking gets in there on Hildebrandt for an 0-2 count. And for Bailey firing in on the hands of Hildebrandt. For Hildebrandt just kind of locked him up there, couldn't get his swing around. And now Bailey after those pretty straight fastballs, now he can go to his breaking ball that he's been utilizing so well. The 0-2 to Hildebrandt, but that one down low in the dirt as Rodriguez is going to go out and hand Bailey the ball a little bit. It'll be a 1-2 count. And for Tristan held up on that one. It's good play discipline to see from him. Such a young kid who's been struggling at least defensively so far in this game. Again, for Hyannis, they don't have a hit so far through two and two-thirds innings. Just getting one base runner can really swing things. The one-two into Hildebrand Thinks about going, but the breaking pitch just misses inside for a 2-2 count. Damn, that breaking ball from Bailey, it's enticing. I mean, it, it goes right over the heart of the plate and just dies at the very last second. So for Hildebrandt to want to swing at that one, I, I even wanted to swing at it from here in the broadcast booth. It's not an easy thing to do, but he works his way into a 2-2 count. Bailey, the 2-2 into Hildebrandt. Big swing and a miss upstairs for strike three. And the final out as Brandon Bailey has retired the entire lineup. One go around against Hyannis. We head to the top of the fourth, still a 1-0 lead for the Red Sox. You're listening to Arbrox Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Curry College offers 14 NCAA Division III athletic teams in sports such as football, baseball, softball, basketball, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, tennis, cross country, and volleyball. Read about the success of the Curry Colonels and their championship teams. It's all online at curry.edu. Welcome back into McKeon Park. First pitch in from Devin Smelter has popped up into the outfield. Jake Knoll coming in. Hildebrandt going out towards third base in the grass. He'll make the grab for out number one for Mike Donadio, left fielder St. John's. Now one for two on the day. Coming up to bat now, the number eight hitter in this YD lineup. Third baseman out of Houston, Josh Vidalis, who's 0 for 1 on the day. Grounded out to Colby Bortles in his first at bat in the second. YD has a 1-0 lead in this game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship over the Hyannis Harbor Hawks here at McKeon Park in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Beautiful night after some rain yesterday. Smelter on the bump for his fourth inning of work. First pitch into Vidalis, catches the bottom of the strike zone for strike one. Yeah, and really, uh, things have been going pretty well for the YD Red Sox. Brandon Bailey has been dealing. He's retired the first nine that he's faced, perfect through three innings. But credit Devin Smelter. He looked a little bit better in that third inning, did allow a couple base runners, but a nice solid play by Jake Knoll out in left field, helped his pitcher out, kept his score at 1-0. Yeah, one in from Smelter. That one's chopped. Colby Bortles reaching over. He'll make the grab. Tossed over to first for out number one. Defense looking more solid than they have. Already have three errors on the day through just the first two innings. And that's a nice job by Bortles, though, really, to take the initiative over from third base. You saw Hildebrand was kind of moving backwards a little bit, waiting for it to come to him, while Bortles going for it all the way, making the play. Two outs now here in the top of the fourth inning. Smelter looking for his first one, two, three inning as the number nine hitter, Nate Rodriguez, the catcher out of Arkansas, steps into the plate. He'll take ball one inside. Yeah, for Smelter, just to rack up these outs consecutively is really what you want to do. He ended up getting two outs with only one man on, but then allowed a single, and that really started the carousel for YD. The 1-0 from Smelter. That one's hit into the outfield, and it's going to get down for a single into shallow shallow center field. 
Yeah, now for Smeltzer with two outs, you allow another single. And every single inning so far, YD has gotten at least one base hit. So far, their hit total is already at six. For Smeltzer, you kind of have to limit the damage a little bit. He's going to be ridden out in this game as long as manager Gaspin can possibly have him in. Although he's allowed a number of hits in this ball game, only one of them has come around to score. So you got to like that a little bit. Smeltzer is bending but not breaking. That's important to see from one of your best pitchers all summer. Harbor Hawks trail the defending champs in YD 1-0. A runner aboard here with two outs in the fourth. The first pitch into the number one hitter, Cole Billingsley, is in there for ball one. Billingsley on the day is 0 for 2, though he did reach on an error in his first at bat and came around to score the lone run for YD. The 1 0, that one's fouled back down the third baseline. It'll even up the count at 1 1. Cole Billingsley out of South Alabama playing center field here for YD. Has a 133 batting average in this postseason. Four hits. Smeltzer looks over at first. Delivers the 1-1. Now one. one's going to be called for ball two. Don't mind that pitch too much from Smeltzer. A little bit more inside than you would have liked if you're Devin. And if you're Jake Rogers, just a very nice job to corral it. But again, it kind of brushes Cole Billingsley off of the plate a little bit, perhaps for a slider on this next one. Smeltzer looks over at first, decides to deliver the 2-1, and that one's chopped foul down the first baseline, evens up the count at 2-2 two and two with two outs. And the big thing that we always talk about with Smeltzer, he's a very big pitch-to-contact kind of guy, and you see with YD, they know that, and we mentioned before how they've been going at first pitches a lot. They've been getting a lot of foul balls. They're trying to find a pitch that they like for Smeltzer to deal to them. Rodriguez taking his lead over at first. The 2-2 two -two in is outside, swung on a miss by Cole Billingsley. He'll get out for the third out of this inning. That's the third strikeout of the day for Devin Smeltzer, and he gets out, leaving a runner aboard. Solid job by Smeltzer to change up locations on the left-handed hitter in Billingsley. Normally, you kind of see him work from the outside in, and it goes right over the heart of the plate. This time, he worked from the middle out, and that really induced that swing and a miss as Billingsley thought it was one pitch, and then by the time he swung at it, it was way out of the strike zone. But regardless, third strikeout for Devin Smeltzer, that's the type of inning that you want. Of course, you can kind of do without the single by Nathan Rodriguez, but regardless, you don't allow a man in scoring position. Slow progress made by Devin Smeltzer, but progress is progress however you want to measure it and now offensively you got to have some sort of progress you got to have a base runner got to have a base hit Brandon Bailey doesn't look like he's going to walk anybody he's not going to really force that type of issue upon himself for the offense they got to come around top of the order this is the time to do it Brandon Bailey on the bump the right-handed pitcher out of Gonzaga has gone through one through nine all through the three innings has retired them all a lot of pop outs but also three strikeouts on the day and he'll come out for his fourth inning of work. And that's really the big thing you're looking at right now for Heinish. You're coming in, going to take a second look now at Bailey. And like you mentioned, Sammy, a lot of them have made contact with these guys. I mean, you talk about Rodgers, just the last inning had a nice line out there into left field, just a little more, and it would have probably dropped were it not for the speed of Donadio. They're finding contact. It's now about getting that contact and putting it in a situation where the defense isn't. This offense has definitely cooled since the YD series, but at the same time, all season, this is an offense that once it starts to spark, it catches fire and can go a long way. That's the thing. Once this offense catches one, maybe two hits in one inning, of course, for YD, they haven't been the most solid defensively in this series, but all it takes is one, and then the rest of the team will start gathering around that one. Where there's sparks, there's flames. Where there's smoke, there's fire. So for Hyannis, that's exactly what you want to see here. They normally score in bunches. This fourth inning is really going to be telling as to where the offense is going to lie the rest of the game. So Duop is the one, two, three hitters in this Harbor Hawk lineup. They were blanketed the first inning down in order. Top of, uh, bottom of the fourth inning, Harbor Hawks trail the YD Red Sox one nothing in this game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship. Crowd still continuing to file in through the outfield. Corey Bird shows bunt. It's popped right over the head of the pitcher who tries to reach for it, and it goes right out of his glove and lands behind him. Corey Bird will be the first base runner of this game. And if you're Corey Bird, you're going to take that either way, especially with that bunt situation. A poor situation there for Brandon Bailey to be that short over on the mound. Any taller, he probably would have made that catch. As you saw on the mound, he was kicking himself after that one. He knew he let that one get away. Not the best bunt laid down by Corey Bird as that one just popped right over the pitcher's head. Barry on the bump just could not get a hold of it, and it just dribbled out into the outfield with not, uh, infield with not many people around him. Corey Bird taking his lead off of first in the bottom of the fourth inning. First base runner aboard for the Harbor Hawks this game. They trail YD 1-0. Corey Bird taking his lead. Austin Hayes in the right-handed batter's box. 
First pitch into Hayes. Now it catches the outside of the strike zone for strike one. The right fielder out of Jacksonville is 0 for 1 on the day. Made contact flying out to the center fielder Cole Billingsley in his last at bat. Hayes bats 321 in this postseason so far with nine hits and three RBIs. Has a runner in Corey Bird on first base. Bird a threat to steal as Gassman has been aggressive on the base pats all season. The 0 1 into Hayes was a pitch out as that'll be ball one even up the count 1 1. And going back to that situation with Bird, that helps you a lot, not only for Bird getting a hit, but also to kind of put a little more pressure on Billy, knowing that it's really his issue that he has Bird over there at first base to get a little bit more going on in his mind. Shadows now directly from home plate into center field on the left side of the field covered in shadows, right is not. Corey Bird taking a big lead over at first. Barry delivers the 1-1, Bird goes, the throw over to second is gonna be tag laid down and he's gonna be called out at second base. Yeah, not the best of jumps from Corey Bird, but an outstanding throw by Nathan Rodriguez. That's a very nice job to help out your pitcher where Brandon Bailey struggled a little bit. Nathan Rodriguez picked him up. That's how YD has really earned their way into this championship series and forced it into a game three, working together and really solid plays when it matters most. Corey Bird caught stealing is the first out of this bottom of the fourth inning. Harbor Hawks still trailing one nothing with Austin Hayes, has a one two count against him. Fans everywhere here at McKeon Park is right behind the YD dugout. There are fans even sitting atop a, a box. I believe that's where the Harbor Hawks keep their field equipment. One out in the bottom of the fourth. The one two from Barry, that one's low for ball two. We'll even up the count of two and two on Hayes. Yeah, now that switches things up for Hayes just a little bit before you had the mentality that a base hit may bring Corey Bird over into scoring position, but now you have to do the work yourself. A base runner's eliminated, but for Hayes, now you got to get yourself on. The 2-2 in from Barry. That one's fouled, reaching, trailing out of play down the first baseline. Count will remain the same at 2-2. Two two. Bobby Melly in the on-deck circle for the Harbor Hawks. He's 0 for 1 on the day. Popped it up to the shortstop in his at-bat in the first. There is an arm warming. On the YD bullpen, looks like it is the pitcher out of Vanderbilt, Ben Bowden. We'll see how long Brandon Barry here from Gonzaga will go. Bottom of the fourth inning, one out. Harbor Hawks trailing the YD Red Sox, one nothing. The 2-2 two -two from Barry. That one's hit foul by Austin Hayes behind home plate. Count on the same 2-2. Two and, two. and for Hayes, now is like Chris mentioned, the situation is completely switched now. You have to fight in this situation with no guys on, try to get Melly up to bat, get him in a situation. And you're not sure now with Manager Gassman had one, tried to steal base already with Bird and with Hayes on now, you're not sure how aggressive he's gonna get or maybe he's gonna try and rely on the bats to get guys around. Barry sets, delivers the 2-2. Hayes swinging a miss there, he'll run down to first as it wasn't caught clean, but the toss over to first is good for out number two. And Hayes is one of those kids that when he kind of thinks that he makes a mistake in terms of swinging at a bad pitch or something along those lines. You can see it emotionally on his face, clearly frustrated with himself as soon as he got out of the batter's box. But that just kind of shows and touches on the fact that Hayes plays with probably the most passion out of anyone on this Harbor Hawk squad, really cares about the team, really cares about winning, and obviously cares about his personal success to a certain extent. But he wants to win a championship. This is exactly where this team is. Through you know two games in the championship series, they want to win. They want to be here. To do it at home would be that much more special. Hometown kid Bobby Melly in the left-handed batter's box swings at the first pitch he sees. That one trailing foul down the third baseline, and it'll land out of play. 0-1 count here for Melly. The first baseman out of UConn is 0 for 1 on the day. Popped it up to Donnie Walton, the shortstop, in his first at bat, though. Batting 333 in this postseason, coming into the day with six hits and two RBIs. Bobby Melly, like you mentioned, Chris, was a high NS bat boy back in the day, and this is his third summer with the Harbor Hawks. Not three full summers. The 0-1 in from Barry. That one's a big swing and a miss there by Melly. It'll bring the count to 0-2. And, and the thing that Bailey's been utilizing to really counter Bobby Melly and how successful he's been offensively is that breaking pitch downstairs and in on the hands of Melly out of the strike zone completely. But for Melly, it's too good to not swing at. That's really where Bailey can kind of fool batters, especially the left-handed pitchers for a right, or left-handed batters rather, for a right-handed pitcher. It's even more impressive to see. 
Two outs, nobody on, bottom of the fourth. The 0-2 count, that one's pitched outside, trying to frame it up as the YD fans do not agree with it. It'll be called ball one, one-two count now for Melly. Melly grabs some dirt, has some words with the home plate umpire. Probably seeing where that one missed. One-two count now for Bobby. Barry sets on the mound. The one-two. That one's swung by Melly, right behind home plate, foul. Count will remain the same at one and two. And this is good on Melly, at least, just to keep staying alive in this at bat, just trying to work Bailey a little bit. We always talk about a lot with Hyannis. They do work their magic a lot of time with two outs. For Melly, it's just about getting on base and starting some momentum. Bottom, in the bottom of the fourth inning, two outs here at McKeon Park, a one nothing game, YD leads. Nobody on the base pats for Melly, who has a one-two count against him. The pitch from Barry. That one swung foul by Melly down the third base side of things. Count remained the same. One and two for him. And you're going to continue to see this throughout the entirety of this afternoon. Fouling pitches off, fouling pitches off, fouling pitches off. That's what Hyannis does. They stay alive in counts. And you can kind of see the Melly Monsters, this time not out in right center, but all the way down the left field wall, down the third base side of things. They're really trying to cheer him on. And for Melly, just trying to produce in this spot. The one, two in from Barry. That one's in the dirt, gets behind the catcher. It'll even up the count at two and two. Melly with a good eye in this at back, keeping things alive. And you can hear with both of these crowds, both of them are getting the slow claps in for both sides, really creating the atmosphere. A lot of fans on tap. Easily the biggest crowd we've seen at McKeon Park this summer. Melly steps out of the box. He's got his cheering section, his high school buddies out there in left field. A two, two count awaits him. The pitch in from Barry. Swung on just getting a piece of it was Melly, so he'll stay alive with a 2-2 count. And I mean, what more can you say about Melly? He is just begging to find some solid contact here against Bailey. Bailey's throwing everything he can so far, just trying to find something. Two outs, nobody on the Bates patch. Shadows reaching even more so across over to right field. Bottom of the fourth inning, Harbor Hawks trailing YD, 1-0. Cheers from both sides now. The 2-2 from Barry. That one swung on a miss by Bobby Melly. He'll go down back-to-back -back strikeouts and out number three of this inning as Barry retires the 1-2-3 hitters in the Harbor Hawks order for the second time. Harbor Hawks trailing the YD Red Sox 1-0. We're going to head to the top of the fifth, but not before a quick break. You're listening to Harbor Hawk Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. For over a quarter century on Cape Cod, Eye Health Services has been providing the best in eye care to our community. Is seeing the game not as clear this year? Having trouble seeing the stat sheet? Let us help you see all of the game up close and in the outfield. Make an appointment at one of our 10 convenient locations on Cape Cod or the South Shore. Eye Health Services, we are here for you. Welcome back to McKeon Park. I'm Sammy O'Brien, joined alongside Chris Morales and Gabe Sussex, heading to the top of the fifth inning here in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Harbor Hawks trailing the YD Red Sox 1-0 in this game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship. Smelter delivers the first pitch, just misses the strike zone there into Tommy Edmond for ball one. The second baseman out of Stanford, though, is 0 for 2 on the day and his last at bat going down in form of the strikeout. Harbor Hawk defense has three errors on the day. Smeltzer six hits, just one run earned though. That one popped up, reaching over towards the crowd as Jake Rogers reached over, but it is gonna end up in foul territory to even up the count at one one. And you gotta like with Rogers and a lot of the guys when you talk about from Melly and Bortles, whenever there's a foul ball, unless it's definite, they're going after it, especially for Rogers. A few pop backs so far, he has put everything in to try and get those outs. 
Harbor Hawks have tried to mount some momentum so far, whether it be defensively or offensively with the Corey Bird single in the last half of the inning, and it's all been crushed so far. The 1-1 is hit between the gap between shortstop and third base, so getting on with a leadoff single here is Tommy Enbin. And for YD, they're just continuing on here. They've had a base hit at least in every single inning. That's five straight innings with at least a base runner. We're on the opposite side of things through four. Hyannis has yet to have, you know, much offense in their own right. Of course, this is going to be a pitching battle. Of course, for Brandon Bailey on the mound, he's really been dealing. His defense has helped him out. For Devin Smeltzer, he's looked very good. He's only allowed one base runner in the fourth. You want to do basically the same thing here in the fifth. Of course, with Gio Bruce in the right-handed batter's box, you got to be careful. This is the third time that he's seen Devin on the mound. First pitch into Brusa is taken for strike one on the inside corner of the strike zone. The DH Brusa out of the University of Pacific is two for two on the day against Smelter. Two singles at that. Is batting 222 coming into the day with, in this postseason with six hits and an RBI. Smelter stares down the runner at first, delivers the next pitch into Brusa. Breaking pitch misses up high, evens up the count at 1 1. Nobody out in the top of the fifth inning. A runner aboard in. Tommy Edmonds standing over at first for YD. Harbor Hawks trailing the YD Red Sox 1 0. Smelter sets, looks over at first for quite some time. Delivers the 1 1. Brusa swung on and missed at that pitch, brings the count to 1 2. Yeah, and where Smelter kind of utilizes that outside part of the plate to the right-handed batter in Brusa. Maybe Brusa thought it was going to be a breaking ball, and then at the last second realized, oh, no, it's a fastball, got a swing. And that's where Smelter really switched things up and got him. Now in a 1-2 count, got to get the put out. Smelter sets the 1-2. Brusa hits that one over the head of the shortstop, Tristan Hiddlebrandt. A single into the outfield as Jake Knoll struggles to pick it up. There's quickly going to be two runners aboard here off of two straight singles and nobody out. And this has got to hurt for Smelter. I mean, you get him into a 1-2 count with Bruce, and he still finds a way to get single and now put two guys on. There's now an arm warming up in the Harbor Hawk pin. Looks like Aaron Savali, the right-handed pitcher out of Northeastern. An aggressive move there from manager Gassman as Savali has been a closer for this Harbor Hawks team the entire season. Only in the fifth here at McKeon Park. Two runners aboard, though, and nobody out with Smelter on the bump. In the box now is a shortstop, Donnie Walton. Smelter steps off the bag as he looks back at second. He'll have to reset. Yeah, and for Walton, this is the kind of scenario that you live for. He had a three-run shot back at Red Wilson Field in his first at-bat in game two of the championship series. And now for manager Ron Pohl kind of sees that the defense and Smelter is in a little bit of hot water with men on first and second. So you might as well talk to everybody, get everyone's attention, and have something here in case Walton decides to lay down a bunt. Of course, for manager Polk, really prides himself upon defense. And with all these defenders sort of having a little bit of a tough day, three errors already through the first couple of innings here, you got to get something going. Got to get the outs wherever you can get them, of course, to the credit of Hyannis, in their favor rather, you have a force out anywhere but home plate. So anywhere that's hit in any sort of part of the infield, you can potentially turn a double play. It's just a matter of what ends up getting off the bat of Donnie Walton and how well Smeltzer pitches. So Smeltzer has a yet to deliver the first pitch into Donnie Walton, the shortstop out of Oklahoma State, who's 0 for 2 on the day, though he did reach on a fielder's choice, reached second on that back in the first off of a throwing air. Runners on first and second. Nobody out in the top of the fifth. First pitch into Walton is delivered in there for strike one. Good start there for Smeltzer in this count. Shadows reaching over almost all the way to right field at this point. Little bit of light on third base and right field as Polk delivers some more defensive signals. Harbor Hawks have shut out the Whitey Red Sox at least on the scoreboard since the first inning when they played their first run. Little bit of danger here with two on. The 0 1 showing bunt there was Walton, and it'll go in for ball one. Evens up the count at 1 1. And you can see with Smeltzer, you saw yesterday what Walton was able to do, and he's trying to keep everything outside to him, trying to work that outer part for Walton and try to induce some kind of ground ball possibly to get more than just one out. With Whitey showing bunt, that'll prompt Ron Polk out to send some more defensive signals. Runners on first and second, nobody out. 
Smelter sets, looks back, delivers the 1-1. One, one. Bunt showed again and not laid down right. Fouls behind home plate. It'll bring the count to 1-2 and two now for Walton. And Walton clearly frustrated with himself, bangs his bat on his cleat, realizes that he missed an opportunity, but for Smelter, you take it as it is. It's now a 1-2 count. A put out in this scenario would be huge. There's still nobody out in this fifth inning with two men aboard. And, of course, you start to hear the fans start to get into this, trying to will the Harbor Hawks into some defensive plays here, trying to will their pitcher into a good situation. Smeltzer sets to deliver the one-two pitch. The pitch, that one's lined out into left field. Not being able to get there is Jake Knoll. He's going to have to run it down. At least one run is coming around to score. Pickler holding up the runner at third. He was about to go, and then he looks up, and staying at third is going to be Gio Brusa. An RBI double here for Donnie Wallen puts YD up 2-0 here in the fifth. Yeah, and that's just struggling once again for Smeltzer. That's two situations now where he's had two strikes and has lost the batter both times, and this one it costs him even more with a run. RBI double there for Donnie Wallen, who's now one for three on the day. He'll prompt manager Gassman to come out and talk with Smeltzer. Runners on first and second, still nobody out. Looks like Devin's may day may be done as Aaron Savali starts walking over from the pen. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Harbor Hawk Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Welcome back into McKeon Park. I'm Sammy O'Brien with Chris Morales and Gabe Susick. A pitching change here for the Harbor Hawks as Smelter's day is done. Went five plus with two runs so far. Nine hits and three strikeouts, no walks. Aaron Savali comes in, the 6-1 right-handed pitcher out of Northeastern and East Winter, Connecticut native. So far in the postseason, has a zero ERA in the two innings he's pitched in. Has allowed one hit, one strikeout. In a situation here with runners on second and third. First pitch. Delivered his ball one into Dallas Carroll, the hot hitting uh, hitter out of Utah. The first baseman is one for two on the day. Singled in his last at bat off Smelter. Nobody out in the top of the fifth inning. Harbor Hawks trailing YD 2-0 now. Spally sets, delivers the 1-0. That one's inside. It'll bring the count to 2-0. Savali struggling to locate the strike zone a little early here. Has been a shutdown reliever for manager Gassman this season. Was named to the Western Division All-Star team, as time is called. 
And for manager Gassman in the scenario, of course, for Smeltzer, just really struggled for YD, really teeing off on the pitcher and already scoring two runs. You're down by two are the Harbrocks. you got to go to your ace in the hole, and that's Savali, who's really been shut down this summer. 2-0 in from Savali, catches the inside of the strike zone there. It'll bring the count to 2-1 on Carroll. Carroll's been a hot hitter in this postseason coming into the day, batting 423 with 11 hits and two RBIs. Has two runners in scoring position here, all with nobody out. Infield playing in defensively on the infield grass, of course, trying to prevent the two runs from coming in. Savali sets the 2-1, and that one catches the strike zone a late called strike there by the home plate umpire. It'll even up the count at 2-2. Two and two. Yeah, and Savali, you can see, is really working these outer halves in the corners of this strike zone, not trying to get anything inside. Savali sets the 2-2. Two -two. Swung on a miss there by Dallas Carroll, heading down to first. He's not going to actually get to first as he's going to be called strike three by the home plate umpire for out number one. That's big job by Savali, and this is the guy that Manager Gassman wants in his situation. It may seem early for him. When you talk about a guy in the regular season who had a 1-0 record, a sub-1 ERA at .36 in 14 games, had five saves, 25 innings, 29 strikeouts, 8 walks, and 13 hits. This is the guy you want out there if you manage Gassman. Two up now is Tyler Houston, the sixth hitter in this YD lineup. First pitch in from Savali. Swing and a miss on the inside pitch from Savali. Brings the count to 0-1-1. Two runners on and just one out here in the bottom uh, top of the fifth inning. Yeah, and for Savali, the longest that we've seen him this summer is two full innings. For manager Gassman, might have told him prior to the game, if it gets in a sticky situation, you might have to go longer. For Savali, he's used to it. Savali sets, and he'll step off the bump. Of course, for Northeastern and a couple starts for the Huskies earlier on in the spring as he did pitch against the Boston Red Sox earlier on in an exhibition game, and he actually went four or five innings pitched. Savali resets. The 0-1 check swing there by Tyler Houston, but going all the way around will bring the count to 0-2. And this is what you need from Savali to come out here and look pretty dominant so far. This is what can help change momentum around. You can see that pitching's now going to come in here and try and get you out of this inning. Still a 2-0 lead for YD, but he's going to try and help his teammates and give them a shot. Savali sets once again. He'll deliver the 0-2 into Houston. Swing and a miss there on the inside corner. Savali gets two quick outs here with two runners aboard and back-to-back -back strikeouts. And an even better job. Of course, a solid breaking ball thrown there by Savali for strike three, but an even better job for Jake Rogers to corral that breaking ball. If he lets that one go away, potentially a run scores regardless of the strikeout. Great job by the catcher from Tulane. Two straight strikeouts for Savali. This is exactly why you put him in these scenarios. Tyler Houston looked off balance that entire at-bat. First pitch into Donatio. Check swings. Going to be called strike one regardless. Left fielder out of St. John's. He's one for two on the day with a single. These two are roommates here this entire summer. Savali and Jake Rogers. Two outs with two runners aboard here in the fifth. The 0-1 is pitched outside for ball one. It'll even up the count at 1-1 on Donatio. Left fielder on St. John's. Batting seventh in this lineup. Batting 300 in the postseason coming into today. 1-1 coming from Savali. The pitch, swung on and missed, and actually losing his bat on that one is Donadio. Heads all the way towards the on-deck circle. Regardless, it'll be strike two and bring the count to one and two. Yeah, this can be a big spot for Savali with runners on third and second. Only one run has scored so far in this inning for Savali to come out and punch these three guys out would be a big momentum pusher. Runners on second and third, both smelters, as Donadio has a 1-2 count against him with two outs. Savali sets the one, two. Swung on hit weakly to Ryan Burke at second. He'll toss it up, throw it over to first for out number three. Savali is able to retire the five, six, seven batters in this YD lineup. Three straight outs as he enters and two runners are left stranded. Yeah, that's an absolutely outstanding job. And for manager Gassman immediately going out, congratulating him, as well as assistant coach uh, Stowers, the pitching coach. And that's exactly why you have a guy like Savali in your roster to really plug up holes, fix up messes. And that's exactly what he does. He came in with a 2-0 deficit. You leave with a 2-0 deficit. But again, as Gabe mentioned, momentum shifter to the offense now. Now it's time for the offense to strike. You got to get something on 
Brandon Bailey on the mound, who's towing the rubber for his fifth inning of work. From what we heard prior to the start of the game, Bailey wasn't going to go that far into it, but for manager Pickler, he's not going to take out some guy who's you know only allowed one base runner so far through four innings pitched. For Bailey, you continue on if you're a fans of YD, but for Hyannis, you got to strike in this inning. Yeah, and if I'm manager Gassman, I'm going to my guy and saying, listen, you guys are only down by two runs. He's like, I've seen you score multiple runs. He's seen them score five runs with two outs in one game in the playoffs. You know that, yes, it's a two. The 2 nothing game, and yes, you're getting closer and closer to the end of this game as Highness is going to limit their at-bat sooner or later, but that's what you have to go at if you're Manager Gassman. You have to say you have to get something going. As the entire bullpen for the Harbor Hawks is actually going to come into the dugout, seems like they want to have a lot of juju in the bullpen, uh, in the dugout rather, try and get something going, try and get behind this offense. It's going to be the four, five, six hitters in the lineup here in the fifth inning. So if you're going to get something done, it's got to be now. And this is a big play for manager Gassman right now to move your entire bullpen. We've seen a lot of times the bullpen can get pretty hyped up when situations happen. So to have them now in the dugout, why not go at it into the final brink with everyone by your side in the dugout? Brandon Bailey's going to come on the bump for his fifth inning of work. He's only allowed one runner aboard in Corey Bird, who singled, but that was then caught stealing back in the fourth. Other than that, completely shut down with five strikeouts on the day so far. Blake Tiberi will take his second hack at him as the first pitch delivered up high for ball one. Seems like when Savali came in, some of the momentum was shifting, and this bullpen now in the dugout is definitely going to try and keep that going. And you can already hear it going at this point. You can hear guys chirping already at Bailey and Tiberi. Bailey sets the 1 0 into Tiberi. That one's popped up as Tiberi's clearly upset, throws his bat down on the ground. It'll be popped up to the second baseman, Tommy Edmond. He'll make the catch for out number one. You know, that's a big out for Bailey to get. Understands the situation that he's in. There is still an arm warming out in the bullpen for YD. It is Ben Bowden from Vanderbilt. But for Bailey, continue to ride that wave that you've been having so far through four and a third pitch. For Tiberi, he's got to find that swing. Of course, he popped it up, and that's really been the M.O. for Hyannis so far in this game. Missing by a couple of inches, an inch here, an inch there, and you got yourself a couple base runners. Credit Bailey, though, as he's inducing all of these misses. Bailey sets to deliver the first pitch into Jake Knoll. That'll be called strike one. Knoll on the day is 0 for 1, grounded out to the third baseman, Vidalis, in his first at bat. The left fielder out of Florida Gulf Coast University, batting 286 in this postseason coming into the day with four RBIs and six hits. Bailey sets the 0 1. That one's popped up behind home plate by Jake Knoll, brings the count to 0 and 2. Nobody on and one out here in the bottom of the fifth inning. Harbor Hawks trailing the YD Red Sox 2-0 in this game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League championships. Shadows across the entire infield here at McKeon Park in Hyannis, Massachusetts. As the lights have started to come on and fans are just still all around the field. The 0-2 in from Bailey. That one misses low. It'll bring the count to 1-2 and two on Knoll. Standing in the on-deck circle here for the Harbor Hawks is Colby Bortles, though he's 0 for 1 on the day, has been swinging a hot bat into this postseason, batting 333 with four RBIs. Bailey sets again, the 1-2 into Noel, just getting a piece of it on the inside of his bat, but heading foul above home plate, bring, will keep the count at 1-2. and two. And that's all you can ask right now for Noel with the same situation that Heinz is put in, you're going to be keep pushing back by Bailey. you got to keep fighting him off as hard as you can. Bailey will take some time to reset here on the mound. Jake Knoll in the right-handed batter's box. The one-two coming from Bailey. The pitch, that one's hit by Knoll into center field. Going back as a center fielder, Cole Billingsley. And he'll make the grab out in center field. Jake Knoll will fly out for out number two of this inning. And yeah, I'm not really sure... How much harder you can hit a baseball if you're Jake Knoll out to the warning track. And I'm really not sure how these YD defenders are doing it, but they are tra tracking down every single ball that is laced out to them. That one looked like it would drop. It seemed to hang in the air forever. And Cole Billingsley ended up snagging it as he ran into the wall out in center field. Just an outstanding play by YD. They've been having a lot of those early on. It's Cole Billingsley's third grab in center field on the day today. Two outs now in the bottom of the fifth inning. Harbor Hawks still trailing 2 nothing, and nobody on with Colby Bortles in the right-handed batter's box. He'll take first pitch, strike one. Bortles, the third baseman out of Ole Miss, 0 for 1 with a strikeout on the day, but has been hitting hot late. 
Does have two RBIs in this series alone as he's gone one for five. Those two RBIs coming in game one a few days ago. The 0-1 in from Bailey. That one's hit down the first baseline, but trailing foul out of play. will bring the count to 0-2. crowd really getting into it on both sides of things and from what we've seen from the Harbor Hawk bullpen they have not left the bullpen the entire uh, entire season and now they are joined in the dugout with the rest of the team to try and get something going 0-2 count here for Colby Bortles the pitch in from Bailey and that'll be away for ball one bring the count to one and two Ben Bowden still warming up in the wide deep pen, though Bailey has gone through five innings and not allowed a run, has only allowed one hit, that being Corey Bird back in the fourth. The one, two in from Bailey. Check swing there by Bortles, but not being able to hold up. He'll go down out number three, and the sixth strikeout of the day here for, for, for Bailey. Harbor Hawks go down in order once again. We're going to head to the top of the sixth inning. You're listening to Harbor Hawk Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Welcome back to McKeon Park for the top of the sixth inning. Thank you for listening. I'm Sammy O'Brien, joined alongside Chris Morales and Gabe Sussick. We're here, game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series against the Highness Harbor Hawks and the YD Red Sox. YD currently with the 2-0 lead over the Harbor Hawks. Not much going for the Harbor Hawk offense as they have one hit to the YD's nine. Aaron Savali back on the bump for his second inning of work. Fires in the first pitch to Josh Vidalis, who hits that one right to Bobby Melly, and he'll step on the bag himself for out number one of this inning. That's just a nice job there for Savali. I mean, you come out, you get one pitch, one out, you're going to have to work that way. As you're not sure where manager Gasman's really going to dial up at this point, if Savali goes this long, you know he would love it if he gets shortened innings and stays out there for a longer time. But for now, Savali just had to work. Savali... The right-handed pitcher out of Northeastern came in in the fifth inning with two runners aboard on second and third with nobody out. Struck out the first two batters he saw in the five, six hitters and then got to Nadio to ground out for out number three. First pitch delivered into Nate Rodriguez, the catcher out of Arkansas, is in there for ball one from Savali. The number nine hitter, Rodriguez, is one for two on the day with a single in his last at bat. The 1-0 is popped up by Rodriguez. Looks like it'll be in fair territory. Ryan Burt coming over down the first baseline, and he'll make the grab for out number two. Not the easiest play for Ryan Burt to be tracking all the way back like that. However, as I mentioned earlier, the sun was playing a factor out in right field. That is no longer the case as the sun has gone below the tree line. Everything is in shade as the lights start to turn on here at McKeon Park. A very nice play from the Texas A&M Aggie at second base. Two quick outs for Savali, starting to kill momentum from YD. Top of the sixth inning, nobody on, two outs. First pitch delivered in. Ball one to the leadoff hitter in the center fielder, Cole Billingsley out of South Alabama, who's had a couple of nice grabs in the outfield. Is 0 for 3 on the day, reached on an error and came around to score one of Whitey's two runs. A check swing there. He's not able to hold up, says the third base umpire, and that'll even up the count at 1-1. Savali dealing 
through the oh, almost two innings that he's been in so far. Two outs here, nobody on. The 1-1 one, one into Billingsley. Just misses the bottom of the strike zone, brings the count to 2-1. and one. Billingsley batting 133 coming into this postseason with four hits. The 2-1 there, tried to lay bunt, but it's going to head down foul, and it'll even up the count at 2-2 two and two for Billingsley. Yeah, an interesting move there from Billingsley. Really didn't show bunt at all in that at bat, and then just really went out and straight did something to try and catch everyone off guard. He basically did. It just went foul. Heron Savali on the mound for the Harbor Hawks. Like you said, Chris, in that exhibition game, shook out three major players for the Red Sox, one of those being David Ortiz, Hanley Ramirez, and the other, Xander Bogarts. So he's got some stuff, as we've seen so far on his Cape season. Time is called late as Savali winds up. He'll have to reset. It's going to be a 2-2 count here on Billingsley, the center fielder out of South Alabama. Melly Monsters really getting into it in left field as some chants are starting now. Crowd all around just getting into it. Some YD fans trying to show some support. The 2-2 in from Savali. That one's hit. Right to the second baseman, Ryan Burke, reaches over, throws it over to first route number three. The first one, two, three inning for the Harbor Hawk defense in this game as they get the eight, nine, one hitters to go down in order. And that's exactly what you need from Savali in a very limited amount of pitches as well for him to get out of this inning quickly. The defense showed up well there now. It, for Highness, it's been what this game has been about for the entire playoffs, especially but what it's not been about, their bats. They're just having a struggling situation to find a way out there. It looks like it will be Brandon Bailey still on the bump for YD. At this point, he has been dealing. For Highness, you have to get away to work this guy. Brandon Bowden is waiting in the bullpen, but at this point, you might as well try and throw this guy out of the mound and get a new guy in. Yeah, the thing for manager Gassman in this offense is quite simple. If you don't get Brandon Bailey out of the bump, he's going to continue to work on the bump. It seems like manager Pickler only wanted to ride Bailey so long, but Bailey has exceeded expectations. He's only allowed one base runner this entire ball game, a near-perfect game. And if you consider the fact that Bailey really put that on himself, if he backed up a little bit further on that pop fly by Corey Bird, it would have been an out. And as of right now through this ball game, it would have been 15 up, 15 down. For Hyannis, you got to start getting something going offensively. That's the only way you're going to see a new arm come into this game. Of course, the two arms that are rumored to be coming in, Ben Bowden and Chad Hawken out of Cal State Fullerton, both of those are stud relievers for YD. Of course, for manager Pickler, he has all his ducks in a row right now. But for manager Gassman, a couple swings here, a couple base runners there can really spoil the party for the team coming in on the road. So we'll set up here in the bottom of the sixth inning at McKeon Park. Bailey is on the bump for inning number six. Has only allowed one hit this entire game back in the fourth to Corey Bird, the center fielder out of Marshall. He'll deal second time through with the 7-8-9 hitters. Jake Rogers in the right-handed batter's box, 0 for 1 on the day. Flew out to the, the left fielder, Mike Donatio, in his first at-bat. First pitch in from Bailey is up high and outside. 1-0 count for Jake. Catcher out of Tulane, batting 235 in these postseasons coming into today. Four hits, four RBIs, and four runs. The 1 0 from Bailey. Now one catches the inside of the strike zone. It'll even up the count at 1 1. In the on deck circle is Ryan Burke, who has been extremely hot in this postseason for the Harbor Hawks, batting 364 through the six games so far. Ben Bowden warming up as he has been for quite some time for YD. The 1-1 one, one into Rodgers, catches the bottom of the strike zone there, and it'll bring the count 1-2 and two against Rodgers. And the one thing, if I'm Andrew Gass, we talked about before how this team is very good offensively and how on a dime they can turn on it. In the regular season, they scored 94 runs past the fifth inning. That's over 50% of their runs from Andrew Gassman. He can't be too worried. 1-2 into Rodgers, just getting a piece of that one, heading foul behind home plate. Count will remain the same at 1-2. and two. Nobody on, nobody out here in the bottom of the six. Harbor Hawks trailing the YD Red Sox 2-0 as they only have one hit of offense in this game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship. Bailey sets the one, two into Rogers. That one misses. It'll even up the count at two and two as the YD fans are not happy with that one. Yeah, for Brandon Bailey, he's really trying to locate that bottom part of the strike zone, but for home plate umpire Rick Del Vecchio, he's really been keeping his strike zone very consistent throughout this game. 
Not giving an inch really here or there for Bailey. He's going to have to earn the strikeout. A 2-2 two -two and a Rogers. That one just getting a piece of it, too. Fouling back behind home plate. Count will remain the same for him. No more shadows across the field here at McKeon Park as the lights are on. A slight wind breezing out towards right field. Harbor Hawks trailing YD 2-0 with nobody out and nobody on here in the bottom of the sixth. The 2-2 two -two in from Bailey. And that one's upstairs. It'll bring the count full for the first time in this game. And that's what you needed, Drew Rogers, having a good eye really at home plate, finding a way to get on base. At this point, it doesn't matter if you get a hit. You haven't done so well hitting one. Maybe let Bailey work your way on the mound for you. Bailey first time with a full count. The payoff pitch. Now one catches the inside corner of the strike zone as Jake Rogers was about to take off his pads to walk down to first. He'll be called strike three out number one. And that one is big for Bailey to get. There's no two ways about it. For Rogers, thought that was a bit inside, but for Bailey, the perfect pitch to throw to the right-handed batter. Painted that inside part of the strike zone perfectly. And for Rogers, couldn't really swing at it anyways as that was in on your hands. You wouldn't have gotten the barrel of the bat around enough in order to make solid contact. Just a great pitch for Bailey to fire. So that'll be out number one of this inning. The seventh strikeout on the day for Bailey on the bump, who has just been unhittable, minus Corey Bird's bunt, bunt that went over his head for a hit. One out in the bottom of the six, nobody on. First pitch into Ryan Burke is hit out into the center field, but Billingsley, barely having to move, gets under that one for out number two. Two up now is the number nine hitter in this Harbor Hawks lineup. The shortstop out of Cal State Fullerton, Tristan Hildebrandt, who's 0 for 1 on the day with a strikeout. Bailey has been shut down through these six innings. As we heard, he was only supposed to go through about four or so. He did have a 302 ERA on the season in his seven starts, well, having 32 strikeouts, 11 walks, and 32 hits, but here only one on the day. First pitch into Hildebrand is breaking pitch that gets in the strike zone as Hildebrand tries to back out of the way. It's going to be called strike one. For Bailey, just been keeping batters off balance all day with that breaking ball, and Hildebrand really looks silly with that one as he kind of walked away, thought that that one was going to hit him, but it boop, right over the heart of the plate. The 0-1 into Hildebrand. That one's popped up into the infield. It's going to be in fair territory just by the first baseline making the catches. Tommy Edmond, the second baseman for out number three. Bailey retires the 7-8-9 hitters in order as he's retired every one in this Harbor Hawks order down in order. The Harbor Hawks are trailing the Whitey Red Sox 2-0. We're going to head to the top of the seventh inning, but not before a quick break. You're listening to Harbor Hawk Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We move on to the top of the seventh inning here at McKeon Park. Game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series. So far being controlled by the YD Red Sox alongside Gabe Sustick. Chris Morales giving you Harbor Hawks baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Aaron Savali toes the rubber for what is now his officially longest relief appearance on the summer as he goes into his third frame of work. He'll deal with Tommy Edmond in the right-handed batter's box and the Northeastern Husky fires a first pitch fastball upstairs. Brings the count to 1-0. and oh. Savali came in relief of Devin Smeltzer as Devin was taken out with two men on board in the fifth inning as Edmund swings at the next pitch, fouls it away down the first base side, evens the count at 1-1. One and one. 
Zavali struck out two and then induced a ground out. One run did score in the frame, but that was off of Devin, and Savali really slammed the door on YD. And, I mean, at this point, this is what Savali needs to continue to do for his team. 1-1 one, one on the way from Aaron. He'll fire a nasty breaking ball in. Edmund swings and misses, and that'll bring the count to one and two. Savali's retired six straight. And that's what he needs to do. Like I said, his sees that the offense for Highness has not been able to shift gears into a faster pace and been able to get multiple hits in a row and try to score runs. Looking for victim number seven in this seventh inning, and he fires another breaking ball in on the hands of Edmund. He has to get out of the way, does Tommy. That'll even up the count at two and two as it just misses the strike zone. Two, three, four, do up for Aaron Savali and the YD Red Sox. As the 2-2 on the way, nobody out in the seventh. Savali fires another nasty breaking ball. It's his curveball this time, and that will be another strikeout for him as that is his third K on the afternoon and one out through this seventh. And that's exactly what you need, like I said, from Savali. You need to find a way to work these guys. He's doing amazing so far. Coming in relief appearance, we said this is Manager Gassman's guy, and he's proven it. We knew that when Savali came in in that fifth inning, it would be more than likely his longest relief appearance as Savali deals the next pitch into Gio Brusa, who is a switch hitter out of the University of the Pacific. We saw him in the right-handed batter's box against Smeltzer. Now in the left-handed batter's box, excuse me, against Savali as he swings at the first pitch he sees, and that'll go down to strike one. A one count from Savali, who has retired seven straight as a couple of arms and catchers go out into the bullpen for Hyannis. Big swing and a miss by Brusa quickly brings the count to 0-2. It looks like Chris McGrath is one of those pitchers, and the second one can't be identified as of right now. Perhaps Will Stillman from Wofford is the other. As Savali goes into his windup, 0-2 on the way. Breaking ball swung on by Brusa into the YD dugout, and he'll stay alive with two strikes. Yeah, it also looks like Mark Skinner went out there as well to go along with three guys, maybe one just to protect the bullpen while they're warming up. But right now, that's what you want to see from Manager Gassman, always moving things. Even though Savali's been dominating, he has to look at the next step. 0-2 with one out. Breaking ball right over the heart of the plate. Gio Brusa can do nothing but watch it go by. Two straight Ks for Aaron Savali, four on the afternoon, two outs in the seventh. And once again, Savali, straight dealing. This is what you need. This is something you have to show to your team. The rest of the guys, they're all on the edge of the dugout watching this guy go. You have to think, this guy is helping us stay in this game right now. We have to get something going for him. The opposite side of things in the bullpen, Ben Bowden from Vanderbilt continues to warm up in what is his third inning warming up in that bullpen as the first pitch dialed up to Donnie Walton. Downstairs in the strike zone for ball one. For Walton is a switch hitter as well from Oklahoma State. As Savali fires in the 1-0, swung on by Walton. Well out of play as giving it chases Bobby Melly down the first base side, but it will land foul, even up the count at one and one. A lot of switch hitters here for YD. It works into their favor a number of different times. Of course, for Savali, has yet to allow a base runner. And for manager Gassman, this is exactly what you wanted as Devin allowed a base runner in every single inning. But now Savali is really giving the Harbrocks a chance to come back. The problem is that their offense has only mounted one base runner all game. 1-1 one, one on the way. Swung on, fouled away by Walton. That'll bring the count to 1-2 and two with two outs. And this is where you need to see Savali deal that nasty pitch that we've been talking about so far. Get this guy out. Really push momentum. And he's been shutting down Whitey's offense today. 1-2 on the way. Fastball upstairs. Evens the count at 2-2. Two and two. As Savali tried to induce some high heat, but Walton betters him on that one. He'll stay alive for one more pitch. We, we talk about a lot, Chris, how momentum can help offensively, defensively, showing it as well. 2-2 two, two on the way. Savali deals fastball outside. It'll bring the count full for the first time since Savali has gotten into this ballgame. The stage is set here for Hyannis to mount a comeback. Their offense needs to come. Payoff pitch swung on by Walton right side. Reinberg. Reels over to his left, and it goes underneath his glove. And that might go down as error number four for Hyannis on this ball game. You allow a free pass to get on. That could have been out number three, but Savali will have to see him work from the stretch for the first time this afternoon. And that will go down as a hit, though, but that's going to hurt for all of Hyannis as defensively they've been just – the balls have just been sneaking past these defenders all day long. It hurts for Savali because now you give Whitey a little bit of momentum now. For Donnie Walton, moves him to two and four, two for four rather, on the day, and that'll bring up Dallas Carroll, who has been swinging a hot bat up until today. It's only one for three so far. He'll have to deal with Savali, and he'll fire in a first pitch breaking ball downstairs for ball one. Of course, the defense still playing 
at their normal depth as Bobby Melly will be holding on. Donnie Walton over on the first base side of things. The first base runner to reach since that fifth inning. As Savali, a pickoff move over to first, not in time, as Walton back with a slot. Ten hits offensively for YD as they had 18 in game number two. That's 28 in less than two full games played for the Red Sox. 101 on the way, swung on right up the middle by Dallas Carroll. Ryan Burke there to cover right over second base, and that'll go out as out number three. Aaron Savali allows one to reach, but will go to the bottom of the seventh where now the offense has to come through. We'll see if Brandon Bailey will tow the rubber. It does not seem like that will be the case as Ben Bowden will come in in relief. The Vanderbilt Commodore relieves Brandon Bailey, who had six solid innings of work, and now Hyannis has to deal with a new pitcher. And at this point for Hyannis, that might be your best medicine so far. It has to be when you talk about Bailey was great all day so far, and really at this point, maybe a new pitcher will do wonders for Hyannis. Seeing some new looks and seeing how well you can get against this guy, that's all you can look at now if you're Hyannis. Yeah, you got to wonder why Pickler took... Bailey out in a situation like that when he has been completely shut down, a one hitter to one of the best offenses on Cape the entire summer, especially coming into the postseason. You have to wonder what's going through his head, taking Bailey out of this game. Uh, but regardless, to the delight of Harbor Hawk fans, you'll get a new pitcher in. It is Ben Bowden out of Vanderbilt University, which is tough, but at the same time, it's a new pitcher. Nine and two thirds innings pitch for the Vanderbilt Commodore in Bowden. The native of Lynn, Massachusetts, as the t-shirt toss might have riled up some fans here to our left in the bleachers as the Let's Go Hawks fans as well as Let's Go Red Sox fans are, you know, chants going on here as really it's a split crowd here, but the lefty from Vanderbilt, nine two-thirds innings pitched, has only given up six hits in these playoffs. He does have two walks, nine strikeouts, as he seems to be a stop for manager Pickler as he wants to continue on this game and really stymie the offense for Hyannis. And this has to be the prime spot for Hyannis when you talk about how Bird is going to be up to bat. It's going to be the straight up stop of the lineup for Hyannis. This is where you got to go. You got the two speed guys in Bird and Hayes that have also got some nice hitting in them as well. And then you go down to the rest of the lineup when you talk about it gets the bigger bats in Melly, Tiberi, and Noel. This is where you got to find something for Hyannis. Another defensive change made by the Harbor Hawks as the Cincinnati Bearcat and Ryan Noda will be over at first base. His natural position, Dallas Carroll, will be removed from the game. And Noda will be batting in place of Carroll in the five hole for YD. The lefty from Vanderbilt toes the mound in Ben Bowden. And the top of the order due up for Hyannis, Corey Bird, Austin Hayes, Bobby Melly, as the fans here understand that this may be the best opportunity to do some damage on YD as we go to the bottom of the seventh. Bunch shown by Bird, breaking ball by Bowden, lots of bees, but it'll go down as ball one. And guys, I just walked through this crowd here at McKeon Park. It is standing room only. There is nowhere to move. People are just everywhere where there isn't even seating. Seating I didn't even know existed. Lefty, lefty matchup. Fastball fired in there. Clocked at high 90s by Bowden. Evens the count at one and one. And for Bird, you can see he's kind of waiting, looking what Bowden's given him so far. That's good, but at the same time, you got to start striking a bit. One, one on the way. Bowden sets out the chest and he fires. Bunt showed by Bird, lays down the first base side. Bowden will corral it. Bird tries to beat the throw out and he is called out by first base umpire Mike Collier as really bang, bang play over there at first base. Bird might have been inched out by about a step. I mean, that was a great bunt by Bird over to Bowden. You saw Bowden turn around for a guy his size to be able to do that, not lose complete control of throwing there and just make the play. That's pretty good. For Bowden, stands at six foot four, 230 pounds. He corrals out number one as Bird was the first base runner back in that fourth inning. However, they have not been able to have the Harbor Hawks to get another base runner since. As time is going to be called here by home plate umpire Rick Del Vecchio, as it seems like he's going to call over first base umpire Mike Collier to discuss something down the first base side of things. You wonder what the conversation could be about. Well, Chris, a couple of the banners are down, down the right field side of things. Uh, it's unfortunate to see as the interns do take quite some time to put those up before the game. That'll be a quick fix, though. That might be the doing of some fans who probably want to get a better <laughs> view of things as seems like two relief pitchers for the YD Red Sox will rehang up those banners. And for those fans, you're going to have to find a view another way, as Sammy mentioned, standing room only as 
One of the banners is just going to be completely removed, probably not to the delight of whoever donated that banner to the Harbor Hawks. However, no harm, no foul. One out in this bottom of the seventh. Austin Hayes due up in the right-handed batter's box. Situation is true here. Tension is high, as you can really cut it with a knife. For YD on the verge with a 2-0 lead here in this seventh inning to get back-to-back -back titles in two straight years in Cape Cod, hard to do. As the first pitch by Bowden, swung on by Hayes, popped way up into the sky as Bowden is called off by first baseman Ryan Noda. He slips in fair territory. Austin Hayes goes his way over to second base as the tag is laid down there by the second baseman, or rather shortstop and Donnie Walton. Tough play all around. Noda slips in the infield. And Austin Hayes tries to stretch out a double, and he does not as YD comes up with a big play defensively. Unbelievable how things have shaken out for Hyannis as Austin Hayes is beside himself going back out into the dugout. Two outs now for the YD Red Sox as that potentially could have been the hole that Hyannis was waiting for as Ryan Noda inexplicably slips in the infield dirt, lets the ball fall in fair territory, and then Austin Hayes is gunned out. That might give more momentum to YD, if anything. Hyannis fans beside themselves wondering what else they can possibly do in this ball game to gain momentum. It'll go down as a single, and then being gunned out at second is Hayes. And the first pitch into Bobby Melly to the roar of YD Red Sox fans. Strike one by Ben Bowden. Hyannis Harbor Hawks fans waiting in angst. As the hometown kid comes in for his third at bat, Bobby Melly, a native of Barnstable, 0 1 fastball, rather breaking ball by Bowden in on the hands of Melly. Swung on and missed for strike two. Two outs in this seventh inning, two strikes by Bowden, the lefty in relief of Brandon Bailey, who pitched perhaps the game of the summer for YD. Two hits on the day for Hyannis as Melly. Instinctively calls time as Bowden looks in on his catcher, Nathan Rodriguez. But my goodness, what else does Hyannis need to do? I mean, you're exactly right, Chris. At this point, you got to be shaking your head if you're manager Gassman. You've never seen a situation before where this team has been struggling so badly offensively. 0-2 oh, on the way from Bowden. Fastball right over the heart of the plate. Strike three. Roar of YD once more as Bowden goes and toes the rubber as he... Has a couple things to say out into the air. Pumps up his teammates and will go into the top of the eighth inning as Hyannis continues to struggle. Down by two in game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series. We'll take a quick break. You're listening to Harbor Hawks Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We continue on here with this top of the eighth inning now for McKeon Park in game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series. Series tied up at one game apiece. Winner take all. Loser goes home without any hardware for YD on the verge of their second straight Cape Cod Baseball League title. Alongside Gabe Sustick, Sammy O'Brien, Chris Morales giving you Harbor Hawks Baseball in the Championship Series. Game number three from McKeon Park. Aaron Savali toes the rubber for what is now his fourth inning of relief as he fires into Tyler Houston, and the Butler Bulldog will foul one away for strike one. Interesting go-arounds in the bottom of the seventh. We'll get to that after this pitch as the 0-1 breaking ball outside paints that corner, brings the count to 0-2 as pop fly by Austin Hayes, routine fly ball for Ryan. No to the new defensive first baseman for YD. He slips in the infield dirt. 0-2 on the way from Savali, chopped into the right side of the infield past Bobby Melly and Ryan Burke. Base hit 
for the YD Red Sox as they have another base runner in this eighth. They had a base runner as well in the seventh inning, but Savali did good work of getting him out of that. And, I mean, going back to what you're talking about, Chris, for Highness, you got Austin Hayes. You saw him get greedy there. You tried to get over to second base, put a runner in scoring position, but at this point, YD paying very close attention. They're on every single point right now defensively that you can't try to get greedy, and that's what Hayes did, and he put in a situation then with two outs and then Bobby Melly looking for strike three. Two arms warming up in the Hyannis Harbor Hawks bullpen as Savali works from the stretch against Mike Donatio and a pickoff move to first base not in time. Tyler Houston with that single has now pushed the hit total for YD to 11. And now at this point, you've got to put more work on Savali. You know that you don't want to do it to your best guy. You guys, guys, more, you got more guys warming up. But at the same time, Savali's been doing so well that you have to feel bad at the offense. You can't get him anything. Bobby Melly goes up as it looks like a bunt might have been laced. But instead, Donatio laces it right up the middle for a single. Infield defense does not work as manager Polk dials something up at the last minute. And now men on first and second as Savali has allowed two straight base hits after not allowing one through his first two innings of relief. Yeah, I mean, it looked like there for Highness, looked like you played your hand too soon there and had enough time for Donatio to not try and bunt there. If you guys see coming up both on the sides there, he's not going to try and bunt. And he got nice contact and get into the outfield. A 2-0 lead for YD. And for Hyannis, a two-run deficit is slowly being threatened here in this top of the eighth inning with men on first and second, nobody out. As now Josh Vidalis sits in the left-handed batter's box. Savali has to step off the mound, gather himself. As he'll toe the rubber one more time. Of course, for the YD dugout, have been fired up this entire ball game as well as their fans down the first base side of things. And what a feat it would be to be down 1-0 in a series and come back in two straight. First pitch, bunt laid down the third base side, but foul as Vidalis can't get it in fair territory. Strike one on him. Of course, YD fell 8-1 to one here at McKeon Park just a couple of nights ago. Game 2 at Red Wilson was the exact opposite as YD came out into a pretty convincing victory to tie up the series and now to come on the road for YD and potentially earn back-to-back -back Cape Cod Baseball League titles would be one of the more impressive runs you've seen in the recent span of time. For Aaron Savali, his job is simple. Do not allow any of the base runners to score with nobody out in this eighth. The Northeastern Husky... Looks in, crisscrossing in the infield. Colby Bortles comes in, charges the bunt, lay down the third base side, and it goes past his glove. Not sure how that happened, but regardless, it'll be a bunt for a hit for Josh Vidalis. Everybody's safe. Bases loaded, nobody out. And I mean, for Ines, there's not much more you can do at this point. The stars are not in alignment at this point, where defensively, for YD, they made everything so far. Hyannis has now three errors. It will go down as a hit, but still making those slight plays defensively. The offense has been stymied all day, and the defense in this eighth inning has not been helping out for Colby Bortles and inexplicably lets it go past him down the third base side. Bases loaded situation. Nathan Rodriguez in the right-handed batter's box, perhaps a tipping point. Breaking ball fired in. Strike one for Savali. For Rodriguez, so far today is one for three. Did have his single back in the fourth inning. Tyler Houston at third base, Mike Donatio at second, Josh Vidalis at first as the Arkansas Razorback on the plate calls time. Yeah, and Chris, this is just something we haven't seen from this team the entire season, defensively struggling as much as they have. This is just not what got them here, obviously, and they, they can't get out of their own way right now. A 2-0 lead for YD as they are threatening in a big way with their crowd behind them. All momentum for Hyannis has been halted in this eighth. 0-1 on the way from Savali. He deals breaking ball, swung on and missed by Rodriguez. Keeps him off balance, brings the count to 0-2 with no one out. At the same time, you got to keep liking what Savali's doing. He is not giving up on this. He is keeping going at these batters and trying to get out of this inning without allowing a run to score. An hour and 50 minutes into this ball game, we're well deep in it in the eighth. 0-2, breaking ball, swung on by Rodriguez, gets away from Rodgers, but home plate umpire Rick Del Vecchio says Rodriguez gets a piece of it, perhaps to the delight of Hyannis, as if that got past Rodgers, it would have been a guaranteed run. Tyler Houston has some speed down the third base side, but instead everyone stays put. Rodriguez still at an 0-2 count. Things have come undone for Hyannis in a big way, but can still work their way out without allowing a run. 0-2 on the way. Savali deals fastball, swung on into deep center field. Corey Bird's going to corral it, uses his momentum to come in. Tagging up from third is going to be Tyler Houston. He'll come in safely. The throw into third base will leave base runners stuck at first and second 
but a run does score for the first time on Savali in quite some time. Now a 3-0 lead for YD. And at that point, a nice play by Bird. Really didn't think he'd have the arm strength to get someone tagging up, so to make sure no one else gets to third base, so another pop fly can't do the same thing. Men on first and second, Donatio is in scoring position. Vidalis at first, top of the order coming up for the Red Sox. And now an insurance run in this eighth could make things harder for Hyannis to come back in their offensive innings. One out. Cole Billingsley in the left-handed batter's box. Swings at the first pitch he sees. Gives it a deep drive out to right field. Looking back is Austin Hayes, and it is out of McKeon Park. A three-run shot for Cole Billingsley. Aaron Savali can do nothing but watch it go out. And now a 6-0 lead for the Red Sox as they are well on their way to clinching their second straight title on Cape Cod. Hyannis fans stunned down the third base side of things, completely beside themselves as all momentum has been taken by YD on the road no less. A six-run lead as manager Gassman goes out to talk to his closer, Aaron Savali, who came in valiantly and pitched very, very well in his first three innings of relief. His day will be done as manager Gassman will go to the bullpen for the second time today. Aaron Savali for the last time toes the rubber for Hyannis, a 6-0 lead for YD as we take a quick break here in this eighth inning. One out as the Red Sox lead 6-0 here on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We continue on with this top of the eighth inning here from McKeon Park, the deciding game number three in this three-game series of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series alongside Gabe Sustick, Chris Morales, and Sammy O'Brien giving you Harbor Rocks Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Well, things have come undone in a big way for Hyannis as they now have a mountain to climb in this game number three, a 6-0 lead for the YD Red Sox with Will Stillman now towing the rubber for Hyannis. A three-run home run by Cole Billingsley has broken things open as swung on towards the right side. There is Tommy Edmond with a 1-0 count. Now brings the count to 1-1 one one with one out in this eighth. But that home run might be the nail in the coffin for Hyannis, who has been struggling offensively all day. Yeah, I mean, one mistake there by Aaron Savali just left up, taking yard out into right field, blew this game wide open. But Savali up until that point was completely shut down. Longest appearance on Cape Cod for him. Stillman fires the 1-1, swung on by Edmond as that one is going to go into left field, drops right in front of Jake Knoll as offensively YD has really been going all day. 15 hits of offense on the afternoon as now a man on first after the home run is going to bring Will Stillman into the stretch. And the thing that you're completely amazed by, Chris, the fact that they did this once again, they did it yesterday at Red Wilson Field. You didn't think they could have the ability to kick go this much with hits wise, but they've done it again against really much more better pitching when you talk about Smeltzer and guys from your bullpen, but they just still have found ways to get hits. 33 hits combined in their last two games. Of the YD Red Sox really riding that momentum into game number three. Gio Brusa in the left-handed batter's box takes strike one from Stillman, who has to clean up the mess left here. Of course, he did not inherit a base runner. 
Although Tommy Edmond at first base is Stillman's responsibility. The 0-1 on the way from the Wofford Terrier as he takes a couple peeks at first. Fires an off-speed pitch outside. Evens up the count at 1-1. One one. The issue really all day for Hyannis has been only two hits on the board, and one of them really didn't even matter as Austin Hayes legged out a single, tried to turn it into a double after Ryan Otis slipped in the infield and was gunned out at second. It was 2-0 then. It is now 6-0 in this eighth as the breaking ball outside by Stillman is taken for ball two. Yeah, it's tough looking back in this game. Harbor Hawks tried to gain momentum, whether it was offensively with big strikeouts or uh, a de defensively rather with big strikeouts or offensively getting a couple of hits in some big spots uh, too exactly, but just nothing going. 2-1 on the way from Stillman. He deals a fastball right by Gio Brusa. Not the easiest thing to do. A two-time All-Star for both Brewster and YD. Brusa down to a 2-2 count. And like you mentioned, Chris, with Hayes, we talked about how he got greedy there. You could basically say they didn't really get any hits because they didn't do anything on the Bates pads. Corey Bird got that, but if Bailey was a little bit taller, he probably would have made that play, and then Bird got caught stealing anyway over at second. 2-2 two -two fastball outside brings the count to 3-2, and, and it's an interesting point you bring up, Gabe. For the first time this entire season, Hyannis has looked completely devoid of offense through a solid seven innings of a ball game, and what a spot to do it in in game three of the championship series where you're on the verge of clinching your first title in nearly a quarter of a century. As the runner goes from first to second, it will not matter as the breaking ball downstairs to Brusa is ball number four, and that'll be men on first and second as YD continues offensively with one out. And not only about that, but Sammy mentioned it before for Hines. This is probably the first time we've seen them miss these small defensive plays that we've seen them always make all year long. We've seen it many times before where they've made stunning defensive plays, and today really none have popped up for them. Three errors on the scoreboard. You can make the argument that the numbers should really be four or five the way that Hyannis has been playing defensively as Stillman works from the stretch, deals a first pitch, fastball way upstairs to Donnie Walton, the Cowboy from Oklahoma State for ball one. For Donnie Walton, does have an RBI on the day back in the fifth inning and is two for four. Of course, went two for five with four RBIs and a home run in game number two of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series. The 1-0 from Stillman swung on by Walton. Flare out into shallow right field, giving Chase as Austin Hayes as manager Pickler holds up Tommy Edmond as he was rounding third base. YD not getting over aggressive as the bases are loaded once again in this eighth inning, all with one out. And once again, this is what we saw yesterday with YD. They're just finding ways. They're hitting everything in a situation where there is no highness defender to be found and getting another situation to already get more runs on the board already leading 6-0. Six 16 hits on the afternoon for YD. What else do you need to say? 6-0 lead in this top of the eighth inning with one out. And now Ryan Noda will take his first at bat from the left-handed batter's box, this time with the bases loaded. Stillman fires in the first pitch. Check swing by Noda, fouls it away. Brings the count to 0-1. Dallas Carroll before Noda did have an RBI uh, as he went one for four on his afternoon. Of course, the Ute from Utah will be resting in the dugout now with his team leading by a wide margin. As for the Harbor Hawks fans down the th third base side of things, still very quiet as Stillman looks into the glove of Rogers. An arm still warming up in the bullpen. Looks like Mark Skinner. 0-1 on the way from Stillman. He'll fire, breaking ball over the heart of the plate. Just misses inside to the lefty and Noda evens the count at 1-1. One one. This is the ninth batter to come up for YD in this inning. It was all started off by Tyler Houston single off of Aaron Savali. He came around to score as well as three other YD Red Sox. A four-run inning as of now. Bases loaded. 1-1 one, one swung on by Noda. Fouled away. Brings the count to 1-2. and two. And if you're Stillman at this point, of course, you come in a situation now where really one of your best guys in Savali has not unfortunately led to this game being blown open. Now you're going to be put with the duties of trying to shut this down with as least damage as you can. A big situation for the kid coming out of Wofford. 1-2 on the way for Stillman, as you mentioned. Has had some closer responsibilities earlier on in the summer as well for Wofford. He had 15 saves for the Terriers. As a 1-2 count in on Noda, Stillman fires. Breaking ball outside. Just doesn't have that break. And it evens the count at 2-2. Two and, two. and the other thing that's really hurt Hyannis, but it's nothing really to the fault of the home plan umpire, Rick Vecchio. He's been having, like you said, the consistent strike zone, and Hyannis has not hit it as well as what Brandon Bailey and Bowden have done so far. 2-2 two, two on the way. Stillman fires. Check swing by Noda. Appeal down the third base side. 
Steve Williams, the third base umpire, says Noda did not go around, and now it's a put-out pitch or potentially ball four to Noda with this next one from Stillman. Nobody to put the Cincinnati Bearcat, or nowhere to put him, rather, with the bases loaded. Tommy Edmond at third, Gio Brusa at second, Donnie Walton at first, and Noda awaits in the left-handed batter's box. Stillman sets, payoff pitch, breaking ball upstairs, ball four, RBI for Noda, seventh run comes in for YD, 7-0 lead in this eighth. Not much else you can say in this scenario. The YD Red Sox have batted around, and now they have plated the fifth run in this eighth inning alone as slowly but surely things get out of hand for Hyannis as the one out that was recorded in this eighth was a sacrifice fly by Nathan Rodriguez. At that point, it was a 2-0 game. This inning has already seen two Hyannis pitchers. Manager Gassman might make it three as he works his way out to the mound. The 7-0 lead here as Tyler Houston will now come up at bat for what is his second inning of work. The motion was made to the bullpen, and Will Stillman's day in relief will be done. 7-0 lead for YD as we take a quick break of pitching change in this top of the eighth inning with one out. Hyannis trailing by seven in game three of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series. You're listening to Hard Rocks Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We continue on with this eighth inning here, all with one out. The YD Red Sox, since recording that out, have scored two extra runs of insurance. It is now a 7-0 lead for the defending champs on Cape Cod alongside Gabe Sustic, Chris Morales, a pitching change before our break as Will Stillman's day in relief was over. And now the man from Troy and Mark Skinner will tow the rubber for the first time in quite some time as he dials in a first pitch to Tyler Houston for a strike. For Houston, this is his second at-bat in this inning alone. As the 0-1 by Skinner swung on left side, Colby Bortles will corral it at third, fire in home, as that will get the force out of Gio Brusa for out number two. No one scores, but a double play could not be turned as the speedy Houston gets down to first base on the fielder's choice. And Gio Brusa having a tough time trying to find home plate the second time he's been moving over to home and hasn't been able to score so far. Nice job by Bortles to see that corral it in time and keep it only at a 7-0 game. This is imperative for Hyannis to get out of this inning without further damage. Mike Donatio in the left-handed batter's box for the second time this inning as well. Takes a fastball for strike, or rather ball one inside. With two outs in this eighth inning, 16 hits for YD. What else do you need to say? A seven-run lead. Fastball inside again. Skinner loses his control a little bit and now has a 2-0 count. Yeah, and it's tough. I mean, obviously for the Harbor Hawks pitching-wise, it's come undone. Needed three different pitchers in this inning. It's ballooned to a 7-0 lead. 2-0 on the way from Skinner. Fastball right over the heart of the plate. Brings the count to 2-1. and one. Really the only upside you can take of this is though it is a 7-0 lead. You have seen this offense spark. Uh, not today, but at times throughout the season, you have seen them spark. 2-1 on the way from Skinner. Check swing. Holding it back is Donatio. Brings the count to 3-1. and one. The member of the St. John's Red Storm is 4 for his last 8. Throw in an RBI as well as a run scored, and you're having yourself a pretty good playoffs as the next pitch swung on and missed by Donatio quickly brings the count full for Mark Skinner. 
Yeah, this is big for Skinner right now. Just if you want to find any slither of momentum right now, it's Skinner punching Donatio out. Payoff pitch. Swung on and missed by Donatio. A great job for Skinner to come in and stop the bleeding. Picks up his first strikeout in quite some time. And now with three outs in this eighth, finally the Harbor Hawks offense can come up. But you give up five runs in that eighth inning, you make your job very, very hard to come back from, especially considering... Ben Bowden will tow the rubber for what is his second inning of work, and you've only mustered two hits offensively the entire ballgame. Yeah, we talked for Ben Bowden, obviously from Vanderbilt, was in the College World Series. He's in this situation now. He's been in this before in closer games, and now to come in a situation where his team leads 7-0, doesn't point to the good signs of Pinus. The only thing you can go on at this point is say, you've found ways to create offense before. Of course, today, this hasn't been a scenario we've seen before where they've only gotten two hits up to this point. But at this point, there's nothing much left you can do but dig deep and find something. For Hyannis, they've only been shut down, shut out rather, two other times in this entire season. One time was to this YD Red Sox team back on 4th of July when Ricky Thomas towed the rubber at Red Wilson Field. And for manager Gassman and the Hyannis Harbrocks having a bad case of deja vu in Game 3 of the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series, you now trail by seven. What is Gassman probably telling his team in this dire of a situation? You got to tell the bats to get going. This team has done this before, not seven runs, six runs they came back from a game against Falmouth just a few weeks ago, kind of a turning point in the season that the offense came. Didn't end up coming in a win is the one tie on the season, but they were able to muster it. All it takes is for runners or for batters rather to start getting on base and it has to start here. It absolutely does with only six outs left to the Harbor Hawks season. Something has got to give one way or another for Ben Bowden. Your job is simple. Get in and out of the eighth. You can even allow a run or two. Won't really matter too much, but Blake Tiberi will start things off as he'll take a first pitch breaking ball upstairs for ball one. For Tiberi, much like all the rest of his teammates, his 0 for 2 so far today has popped out two different times, but would love to start the offensive stint here in this eighth. A fastball downstairs quickly brings the count to 2-0 as Tiberi has a good eye. Only two hits, three errors defensively on the day. Not many times have Hyannis had more errors defensively than hits. As an offensive-minded team has really been cold their last two frames as swung on by Tiberi down the third base side, but just foul brings the count to two and one. And if there's anyone at this point that you want Hyannis to be up, it's Tiberi. We've seen all year long this kid fights in his at-bats. He fouls everything off. He waits to see a pitch that he likes and trying just to get on base like Sammy mentioned. 2-1 on the way. Nobody out in this bottom of the eighth. Vanderbilt Commodore Bowden fires in a fastball in the outside corner. Evens up the count at 2-2 two two to Barry beside himself in the left-handed batter's box. Yeah, Ben Bowden out of Vandy in a big situation. He's seen himself in this before as he was in the College World Series just a year ago as he was in these playoffs. They got the ring two years ago. Ben Bowden 2-2. Two two, check swing by to Barry. He fouls it away. He'll stay alive at 2-2. Two and two. But he knows what he's doing in this situation on the bump, has that huge cushion of seven runs, and he's just trying to get through these batters just like Bailey did throughout the entire game. Wind swirling out towards the outfield. That does work in favor of Tiberi as he's looking for his first hit. 2-2, two -two, Bowden fires, check swing, left side. Donnie Walton backtracks, fires on a one-hop. Tiberi, bang, bang, play at first, and he's called out as Donnie Walton Corrals things for out number one in this eighth inning, and how many bang-bang plays have we seen down the first base side? Nice stretch by Ryan Noda. Yeah, you got to like the effort there by Blake to bury in the eighth inning, down seven runs, just trying to get something going, beat out the throw, but at the same time, close plays like that have just not gone the Harbor Hawks' way the entire game. Ben Deluzio will now come in in relief of Jake Knoll, whose season is over here as he will not be able to come back into the ball game. Ben Deluzio, pinch hitter in this eighth inning, interesting move by manager Gassman. Of course, for Deluzio, has been struggling just a little bit in this playoff run. Defensive sub, if anything, for manager Gassman. Does not want to let this lead balloon any further for Deluzio. He'll take his first hacks here against the Vanderbilt Commodore in Bowden on the mound. One out in this eighth. Deluzio awaits in the right-handed batter's box. Big swing and a miss on the fastball outside. Brings the count to... All in one. Yeah, if anything, at this point, Gasman's just trying to switch things up, give him a new look at some new batters. And Luzio so far has only gotten five at bats. He does have one hit, however, in this playoff run. All one downstairs by Bowden brings the count to one and one. For Deluzio has come through in some pretty clutch spots this summer. Of course, he had the game winning single back in game three of the Barnstable Patriot Cup against the Katua Kettleers right here in McKeon Park earlier on in the summer. 
One one, big swing and a miss at the breaking ball. Brings the count to one and two on Deluzio. And this is what we mentioned with Bowden really working on the mound, replacing Bailey, who is already doing great as it is, and really just finding ways to get guys off balance, especially for Deluzio, who just came into the game. One out in the bottom of the eighth, a one-two count for Ben Deluzio as Bowden sets out the belt, fires, fastball, swung on, missed by Deluzio. Another strikeout for the Vanderbilt Commodore, his second of this relief appearance, two outs in the eighth. And I mean, for Highness, like we mentioned, you're trying to find anything at this point. You're trying to dig deep. But at this point, it seems like digging deep is not going to do you much here with a guy like Bowden on the mound. Only two base runners the entire ball game for Hyannis. They trail by seven this late in the game. Colby Bortles in the right-handed batter's box. Takes his first pitch. Fastball downstairs. Close enough for strike one. For Bortles, he struck out two different times in this ball game, both to Brandon Bailey, who quite frankly had the start to remember his start of the summer as it was hands down his best. Way to save it for the last game, of course, for manager Pickler. You'll take that any day of the week as the fastball outside evens the count at one and one. For Bortles, he's been on the verge of pretty hot start here in the playoffs and, of course, trying to put it all together in this final frame. What well, might be his swan song here at McKean Park? Breaking ball outside, brings the count to two and one. 16 hits by YD, two hits by Hyannis, three errors defensively, not really much else you can say in terms of trying to outline the storyline in this game three. For YD, they've taken advantage of every opportunity and Bowden in to shut the door, but he's losing control with a 3-1 count now on Bortles. At that point, that's all you can look at if you're Bortles. He's not swinging that much, just letting Bowden give the stuff to him. Find any kind of momentum you can. 3-1 on the way for the Vanderbilt Commodore. Does not want to walk in a batter. 3-1 on the way, and he'll fire. Big swing by Bortles, and a miss on the fastball. Brings the count full once more. Yeah, with Bowden losing control of some of the last pitches, you wonder why Bortles goes for a swing on that one. Was his count with a 3-1, but big swing and a miss there. Payoff pitch on the way. Hyannis looking for a base runner. Two outs in the bottom of the eighth. 3-2 swung on by Bortles into the netting down the first base side. He'll stay alive with this 3-2 count. Fans down the third base side in favor of Hyannis have been pretty quiet this entire ball game. A couple of scenarios where things might have gone their way. However, YD has really had the lucky dice in this ball game. A seven-run lead late. Payoff pitch by Bowden. Big swing and a miss by Bortles. His third of the afternoon as Bowden retires two straight innings, picking up his third strikeout en route to YD three outs away from clinching their second straight Cape Cod Baseball League title. We'll head to the top of the ninth. YD bats due up, leading by seven. You're listening to Hyannis Harbrocks Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We move on to this top of the ninth inning here at McKeon Park. Mark Skinner toes the rubber for a second inning of relief as YD very comfortably ahead with a 7-0 lead in game three, the deciding game in the 
Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series alongside Gabe Sustick, Sammy O'Brien, along for the final inning, what seems like here at McKeon Park for the 2015 summer as Hyannis trails by seven. 8-9-1, due up for the YD Red Sox. Josh Vidalis has already taken two pitches as the 1-1 is swung on, hit into shallow center field, and what else can you ask for? For Vidalis to pick up what is now his second base hit of the day is really YD late in this ball game, continuing offensively 17 hits on the afternoon. As a pinch hitter seems to be coming in here in relief of Nathan Rodriguez. Swinging the bat will be Connor Wong, the shortstop out of Houston. The native of Pearland, Texas, will be in the right-hand batter's box with a man aboard. Of course, for the, Har for the Harbor Hawks, just looking back on what was a great season as Skinner fires in a fastball, swung up into the air off of Wong. One pitch, and it might be one out as Austin Hayes corrals it. Four out number one in right field. Western Division champs on the ropes as they only have three offensive outs left on their summer. Of course, for manager Gassman, would love to see some playoff magic late. And the man who really tilted things in the favor of YOD, Cole Billingsley, is now in the left-handed batter's box. And at this point, if you're Skinner, your goal is to get, of course, your goal is always to get this guy, but more importantly, for this guy in Billingsley. First pitch, fastball by Skinner, taken for strike one for Cole. If the least you're going to do is try and just find a way to get him out. He really blew things open. Just make sure that he's the guy that doesn't continue to provide offense. Time is going to be called here by home plate umpire Rick Delvecchio and a great umpiring crew that we've had here for this final game of the championship series as Skinner fires in as that pitch goes outside to Billingsley, evens the count at one and one. The new catcher, Arden Paps, perhaps getting his final looks here with the pads on at McKean Park. Of course, a returner for Hyannis in his second straight summer as really things have been lopsided in this ball game from the beginning as the Fastball taken outside, brings the count to two and one. Yeah, and with Paps and Deluzio coming in defensively, you know Gassman was just going to try and get these veterans in for their last game. They have been here the last two summers. Two one, breaking ball by Skinner, goes downstairs, brings the count quickly to three and one. And I think that just shows you how much he respects them as players. They spent two entire summers here on Cape Cod away from their friends and family to be here for him and to get them in defensively in this championship game. Three one, swung on left side, past the glove of Bortles, but it will go in foul territory. Territory, brings the count full on Billingsley. Of course, ball game not yet over. Of course, Hyannis has done a lot of great things in the bottom of the ninth earlier on in the summer, but never with this much of a deficit facing them. They are down by seven as they've only been able to muster two base runners all day. Payoff pitch by Skinner popped up into the air down the third base side, giving Chase is Bortles to no avail as it will go into the crowd and a fan gets a nice souvenir in this ninth inning with a nifty play. At the same time, you kind of have to like Bortles there from third base, still charging over all the way to the fence. At this point, with something like that where you could easily see it fly over, you could easily just waddle your way over there and not really think much about it, but he still kept charging that way. Payoff pitch still on the way from the man from Troy. Skinner from the stretch fires left side or rather right side. Hit there by Cole Billingsley. What else? Another single by YD goes into shallow right. Two straight singles, one by Josh Vidalis and one by Billingsley as they have now tied up their hit total from game number two, 18 apiece in both games. And they've done it simply by finding the holes. It's always been finding those two or three holes, you could say, between the defense. That's where they've gotten a lot of their hits in these past two games. One out, Skinner looks into the glove of Paps as Tommy Edmond in the left-handed batter's box, a breaking ball dialed up for strike one. Force for Hyannis, you really had a lot of hopes going into this uh, championship series as they are down to their final three outs offensively, but of course you'd like to get out of this inning without allowing another one, make the score respectable. As swung on there by Edmund, flare into shallow center. Rounding third is going to be Vidalis. The throw in, not even close, as Corey Bird fires into second base and YD. 19 hits on the afternoon, eight runs have been plated. As really, what else can you say? The pitching has been trying to do their best and YD has just been bettering them with little shots into the outfield here and there. Yeah, and that's just been their game so far, and they're not slowing down at all. They know what Highness is capable of. They don't care how much runs they're scoring. They're just going to keep pulling it on. As YD continuing here, manager Pickler not really holding up his runners in any sort of fashion as 21 hits have been combined by this two teams. 19 of them have been by the Red Sox. Gio Brusa in the left-hand batter's box, firing a first pitch strike. Rather, it's going to be a pinch hitter as he laces it down the third base side as Turner Bias comes in 
uh, to pinch hit for Gio Brusa, whose day is done. And for Brusa, had himself one to remember in what might be his swan song here on Cape Cod. He went three for five. For Bias, saw him earlier on in the summer as well. As he has an 0-1 count, as Skinner fires in a fastball inside, quickly brings the count to 1-1. One one. For the Harbor Hawks, really clinging to life here as they're down by 8. Of course, anything is possible in this game of baseball that we play as the big swing and a miss by Bias quickly brings the count to 1-2. and two. Of course, the writing is on the wall, and YD really has been lights out in their last two games. Yeah, but I mean, at this point, like you said, Chris, Anything can happen in sports, but really, if you're Hyannis. The 1-2 big swing and a miss by Bias gets the strikeout in the ninth, as that'll be out number two in this top of the ninth. You just have to find ways to just figure it out. I mean, giving another run's never going to help your cause in this case, already down 8 nothing. Now coming up will be Donnie Walton in the left-handed batter's box, the switch hitter from Oklahoma State. Will soon be my neighbor in a couple weeks as we're heading down to Oklahoma for... Uh, employment get to that probably a little bit later <laughs> two outs in this top of the ninth inning Walton awaits in the left-handed batter's box men on first and second Mark Skinner fires in the first pitch breaking ball downstairs quickly brings the count to one and oh yeah Chris moving on to bigger and better things got your first big boy job congrats on that that's gonna be really exciting it definitely will be has uh, kind of nervous but swung on there by Walton evens up the count at one and one of course, uh, heading down to uh, Enid, Oklahoma, small town of about 50,000 to uh, broadcast for Chisholm Trail Broadcasting. So if they are tuning into this one, thank you for giving me the opportunity and uh, looking forward to it moving down to uh, the Midwest, Southwest, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> as the fastball dialed in brings the count to 2-1. and one. He doesn't even know where he's going. It's just north of <laughs> Texas. I know that much. It is. It's west. It is northwest, northwest Oklahoma. Know that much as the breaking ball goes downstairs, brings the count to three and one. Of course, it's a bittersweet moment here in the final game. What is game number 51 of the Cape Cod Baseball League summer for Hyannis? Just haven't been able to do much offensively. Of course, you don't want to count them out. They have really done some crazy things in the past, but this one would be storybook if they were to be able to pull it off in the bottom half of the ninth. 3 1 on the way from Skinner. He'll dial up a breaking ball swung on there by Walton, and that'll bring the count full. I mean, honestly, if there's a team that's going to do it offensively, it's going to be this one. They've kind of held in their offense the last two games, and we'll see if they can let it all explode in the bottom of the ninth for one last go around. But with only two hits on the day, it's not looking promising. What a memory that would be. 3-2 on the way. Runner goes. Fastball right over the heart of the plate. Walton sees it go by. Two straight strikeouts for Skinner. We'll head to the bottom of the ninth. We'll take a quick break. You're listening to Harbor Hawks Baseball on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We move on now to the final three outs for Hyannis in the 2015 campaign here on Cape Cod alongside Gabe Sustick, Sammy O'Brien, Arden Paps taking his first at-bat here of game number three in the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series as first pitch fired in by Ben Bowden upstairs for ball one. 
Harper. Arden, a returner for manager Gassman and the Harbor Hawks has struggled just a little bit in this playoff run. Of course, would love to come through for what would be his first hit here in the playoffs. 1-0, swung on by Pabs, fouled away, brings the count to 1-1. One and, one. and if there's any way to find some momentum, he might as well find it with a guy in Pabs who's already been here once before. He's really been the standing guy at catcher for a lot of time. We talked about how he always switched positions with Rodgers. For him to get on base could possibly help just push the momentum dial a little bit for Hyannis. Nobody out here in this bottom of the ninth inning. Standard defense for YD as they really have some room to give in terms of an eight-run cushion. Talk about wiggle room. Of course, for the Harbor Hawks have only been able to have two base runners the entirety of this ball game. Perhaps the weights in the right-handed batter's box. 1-1. One, one. Bowden fires, and that's a fastball swung out of play. Brings the count to 1-2. and two. In the on-deck circle, Ryan Burke due up after him will be Tristan Hildebrandt. Of course, for YD on the verge of potentially facing only 27 batters in this ball game, although they did allow the first, they did allow two base runners, rather. It was a single by Corey Bird. He was caught stealing for out number one back in the fourth inning. And then Austin Hayes had a single, but was called out at second base after he tried to stretch it into two. One, two on the way. Bowden fires. Paps hits this one out into center field, and corralling that one for out number one is Cole Billingsley. And that's really been the story all day for Hyannis. Limited amount of hits, a lot of flyouts, none of them dropping in territory where the defense can't get to. I mean, credit to the defenders that have been out there for most of the game. Donatio, Billingsley, and Houston, they've been putting out their entire legs for every catch. One out in the bottom of the ninth. Ryan Burke due up in the left-handed batter's box, taking on the lefty from Vanderbilt in Bowden, who is in his third inning of work. He has been nearly perfect, only allowing one hit to Austin Hayes. Of course, on that very same pop-up that was dropped into the infield, Hayes was gunned out at second. For Burke, drops at the first pitch he sees, fouled away for strike one. For the Aggie from Texas A&M, is 0 for 2 so far today. Did strike out back in the third against Brandon Bailey, who really had a start to remember. And in game threes, 4YD so far in this 2015 run of the playoffs, outstanding pitching from their starters in game number three. 0-1 swung on by Burke. High heat, missed, gets nothing. Brings the count to 0-2. Every pitch, the YD fans get louder and louder, clinging on to everything coming out of the arm of Bowden. Vanderbilt Commodore up in the count 0-2. Burke awaits in the left-handed batter's box. A new catcher in Chris Hudgens from Cal State Fullerton calling all the pitches. One out in the bottom of the ninth. Bowden fires. Fastball swung on left side into the glove of Donnie Walton. He'll corral. Fire over to first base in time for out number two as Hyannis is down to their final out of the ballgame. And you have a situation now where you've got two Cal State Fullerton guys, one in Hildebrandt, and another catcher in Hudgens. Maybe I have a little talking moment here. As Ryan Burke will work his way back into the dugout, the YD fans on their feet down the first base side of things as they are on the verge of their second straight Cape Cod Baseball League title. They took it all back in 2014, defeated the Falmouth Commodores in two straight games. Deciding game was at Red Wilson Field. Game number three here in 2015 at McKeon Park. Bowden fires in a first pitch fastball downstairs to Hildebrandt for ball one. Of course, for the Harbor Hawks fans down the third base side of things beside themselves as they wondered where the offense went as YD currently on the verge of winning two straight games here against Hyannis, the Western Division champs on the ropes. 1-0 on the way. Bowden fires, chopped up right up the middle. Donnie Walton diving play, fires to first base, not in time. Yeah! as Hildebrandt has himself an infield single. Not done yet are the Harbor Hawks as the top of the order do up. I mean, for Rhinus, that's all you can really tip your cap out to there to Hildebrandt, still legging it out there on that pitch just to find a man on base. What a dazzling play it would have been if Walton were to be able to corral it. For Hildebrandt, a very nice job to leg things out down the first base side as Hyannis fans start to muster up some effort as Corey Bird in the top of the order do up here in the left-handed batter's box. Hyannis has done lots with two outs in this summer. Of course, facing the biggest mountain that they have yet to climb, but manager Gassman trying to will his team on late. Two outs, bottom of the ninth, man on first. Bowden fires, breaking ball upstairs to Bird, brings the count to one and up. Of course, for YD fans, all of them on their feet, all of them cheering, get one more out as the dugout for YD really looking on in angst. Bowden on the mound, 
The lefty fires 1-0, way inside on the hands of Bird. Quickly brings the count to 2-0 as Bowden struggles to find the strike zone. Yeah, and you got a question here for Bowden, really what he's thinking about. You know he wants to get a strikeout possibly on Bird, but at this point, just try and find the strike zone. There is a man all ready to go in the bullpen of YD. 2-0 on the way from Bowden. Downstairs, 3-0 count now for the Vanderbilt Commodore. That arm down the first base side of things for YD. Ready to come in should things get hairy. It is Chad Hawken from what we can see down this side of things in the Hawks' nest. Another Cal State Fullerton Titan, of course. He lights up the radar guns just as well as Bowden does. The Vanderbilt Commodore on the mound. Fires in the 3-0. Fastball over the heart of the plate, taken for strike one. And that might be the last thing if Pinus is even able to find a spot to get Hawken in there to go up with his catcher in Hudgens. Really going to be disaster for Hyannis. 3-1 on the way. Bird awaits. Fires does Bowden. Swung on. Fouled away down the third base side as another fan gets a nice souvenir. As YD now only needs one more strike to clinch their second straight title. 3-2 on the way from Ben Bowden. YD up 8-0. Two outs. Bottom of the ninth, man on first. Hyannis down to their final strike. The Vanderbilt Commodore awaits on the mound. Bowden fires the payoff pitch. Swung on, fouled away as the celebration might have to wait for one more pitch. And I mean, at least for Bird, just got to keep trying to do that, just trying to foul off pitches. Don't give him the satisfaction of a strikeout. The freshman just wrapped up his freshman year from Marshall, batting 346 in this playoffs. Is one for three so far today. On the verge of perhaps maybe his 11th hit. Payoff pitch. Bowden fires and fouled away once again. Bird not giving YD the satisfaction of walking off here at McKeon as he stays alive with a 3-2 count. For Corey Bird, what else can you say about this young man? Just two weeks ago was a pinch runner for Hyannis. Came in, got hot at the right time. Rode Hyannis all the way through the first two rounds of the playoffs. And who else but better to be in the left-handed batter's box in this situation with two outs? 3-2 pitch, Bowden fires, swung on by Bird. He laces this one into left field, and that is going to fall for a single. Tristan Hildebrandt will round second, and this game is far from over. Men on the corners, all with two outs. And for Corey Bird, just to come into that and do a situation like that, like we talked about the whole time, just being able to find ways to get hits, and that's all you need. As we always know, the bullpen and the big out love it when he's been getting hits in these playoffs. We've seen Hyannis make a lot of noise with two outs in these playoffs, of course, they did score five runs in game number one against YD here at McKeon Park, all with two outs. A lot of that was due to errors by YD's defense, but of course for Austin, Hayes can make the score more respectable with one swing of the bat. Hyannis still trails by eight. First pitch in with two outs in the bottom of the ninth. The Jacksonville product awaits. Bowden fires a changeup upstairs, ball one. For YD's fans, they're going to have to wait on just a little bit longer for Austin Hayes, who else better but perhaps the energy of this team. The man who brings the most life into the lineup, the most hard on the field. 1-0 on the way. Hayes awaits in the right-handed batter's box. Bowden sets at the chest, fires, swing and a miss by Hayes. Not the best pitch to swing at. Breaking ball by Bowden. Evens the count at 1-1. One and one. Yeah, and like you mentioned, Chris, for Hayes, has that ability for the big hit. But at this point, you haven't seen it so far, but you want him to not try and take those big major hacks and misses there to try and find a way to get on base as you see with Bowden struggling. After only having two hits so far in this ball game leading up to the ninth, they have two in the inning due to the Harbor Hawks as Hayes fouls away the next pitch he sees well out of play. Brings the count to one and two as Hyannis once again down to their final strike. Corey Bird at first base, Tristan Hildebrand at third. The hometown kid Bobby Melly awaits in the on-deck circle. And what a storybook ending this could be if Melly could just come up for one more at bat. Austin Hayes batting 321 in these playoffs, looking for his 10th hit. 1-2 on the way from Bowden. He'll fire. Fastball swung on. Flair into shallow right field. That's going to fall. One run comes across for Hyannis. Not done yet. All with two outs. Men on first and second. Hayes has himself an RBI single. And like you said, Chris, this might be the storybook ending that Hyannis has been looking for for the guy that has basically been Hyannis for the past three summers. For him to be up at the bat must mean something to Melly. There is no better way than for Bobby Melly to be in the left-handed batter's box with two outs in the bottom of the ninth. The Barnstable native is still looking for what will be his first or second base hit of this championship series, and what a way to do it in the bottom of the ninth. Big swing and a miss on the breaking ball. Down quickly, 0-1 is Melly. 0 for 3 so far today, does have six hits on the playoffs. 
An 8-1 lead for YD. As Hyannis has been able to muster three hits in this inning. Corey Bird at second. Austin Hayes at first. Melly awaits. Bowden fires the 0-1. Breaking ball swung on and missed by Melly again. As Hyannis for the third time in this frame down to their final strike. YD fans have been waiting probably a little longer than they wanted to. Ten minutes for this final out. But Bobby Melly, the Barnstable native, Hyannis all over his heart, bleeds blue and orange. Left-handed batter's box awaiting perhaps what can be the final pitch at McKean Park for 2015. Bowden fires, breaking ball, swung on, right side, past the glove of Ryan Noda. Bobby Melly beats out the throw to first. Men on second and third, bases loaded, not done yet as Ryan Noda could not get it into his glove. Tommy Edmond, the second baseman, couldn't corral it to the covering Bowden. Bases loaded, bottom of the ninth, all with two outs. And Chris, as much as you don't want to get ahead of yourself here for Hyannis, finding momentum, finding it not only with two outs, but every single time, finding it with two strikes on each person as well. Corey Bird, Austin Hayes, Bobby Melly all had two strikes on them when they got their singles in this bottom of the ninth. Now Blake Tiberi, the man who led off the bottom of the eighth inning, now in the left-handed batter's box. The man who's probably hardest on himself more than anyone else on this Harbor Hawks roster comes up in what could be a huge spot for Hyannis. Four hits on the inning. Bowden fires, big swing and a miss to Tiberi for strike one. For Tiberi, 0 for 3 on the day. The Louisville Cardinal takes on the Commodore from Vanderbilt. As for Tiberi, it's all out of his father this summer. A frequent listener to our broadcast. If he's listening, a big spot for your son. 0-1 swung on right up the middle. Bowden has it in his glove, and this is going to do it. YD wins their second straight Cape Cod Baseball League championship. Harbor Hawks leave the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth. An 8-1 victory for the Red Sox as the dog pile is just to the right of the pitcher's mound here at McKeon Park. Congratulations to YD and manager Pickler for a second straight title, and Hyannis was this close to making things interesting in the bottom of the ninth as they had a valiant effort, win game one of the series, but they fall in two straight as YD takes the title. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows how hard it is to win a championship more so than the Hyannis Harbor Hawks haven't won in 24 years, and that'll have to wait a little more. YD winning it for back-to-back -back years, defending champs do it again. That's just something special for them. How hard it is for a manager to not only reconstruct his squad, but to go back-to-back -back years in the top collegiate baseball league in the country is absolutely outstanding. And for manager Gassman and this offense, you got to wonder what happened in this ball game. Solid pitching from Brandon Bailey. Bowden made things interesting in the ninth. And you got to give credit where credit is due. For YD, they did everything they needed to in this ball game. 19 hits on the afternoon, eight runs. What else can you say? But for Hyannis, they showed what they have showed this entire season, and that was heart in the ninth. They did. They showed heart, but at the same time, you look at what happened in the previous scenes before that, really what seemed like an anomaly. You never thought it could be this drastic where you see the offense completely sputter into a tailspin. You've seen it bits and pieces of it sometimes where they've lost some close games and they haven't just been able to get the hits at the right time, but not being able to get much. You've got to credit them for getting – those hits in that situation, like we mentioned, all with two strikes, just keeping pushing on. But, I mean, for YD, when you talk about they beat Brewster, a team that they struggled against, a team that was offensively getting on the right track in two games. They beat Orleans, which could have been undoubtedly one of the greatest teams you would ever see on Cape Cod, both offensively, defensively, and pitching What They beat them in three games, two of them. The ones that they won were 2-1 wins. Just incredible baseball you saw from YD, and especially getting almost 20 hits in each of their two wins against Hyannis. Yeah, Gabe, beating a Brewster team that came in really hot to this postseason and Orleans team that was just shut out the entire year. But got to give credit to these Harbor Hawks. This was easily one of the most fun teams to watch this summer as the bullpen was just alive. Offense was exciting to watch. Uh, Manager Gassman getting his first Western Division title in his seven seasons that he's been here, as well as sweeping a rival in Katuit. Looking back on it, these guys are going to be able to do nothing but smile. It's unfortunate that it ends the way it does, kind of in a blowout, even though they started to come back a little bit. It, but nothing to hang your head on. That was a fun summer of baseball in Cape Cod. It absolutely was. And for manager Gassman, I'm sure he can attest to it as you'll go, probably go off and interview Gassman, Sammy, as it's the last time she'll grace the mics here for 2015 on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. But, Gabe, you and I, we've been through a lot 
And uh, this is one way to end it here. McKeon Park, of course, for Hyannis. An absolutely outstanding summer. Think about it. A sweep of Katua, as Sammy mentioned. You beat them in the playoffs as well. A clean sweep of the Bourne Braves in the playoffs. And it just seemed like it was a little too much. YD came in as the team that was riding the most momentum. And for the second straight year, they rode it to a championship. Yeah, you never want it to be a situation like this where you just absolutely seem like you're out of the game from the gate opening, really, and then that one crushing home run by YD. You don't want it to end like that. But at the same time, just to harp on what Sammy talked about before, it was an amazing season. You had some walk-offs. You had technically what could have been a walk-off against Bourne, which was possibly one of the greatest wins you've seen this season for Hines to do it against that team. Like Sammy said, you can hang your head on this game, but don't hang your head on the entire season. Absolutely not. This is a team that, hands down, rode the West from beginning to end. They completely had control of the division in what was something that we haven't seen in quite some time. For manager Gassman was by no means a perfect season, but there were highlights all throughout. Talk about a no-hitter earlier on in the summer where Devin Smelter took all the highlights, all the accolades. No better of a kid to have it. And, of course, in his start here, wasn't exactly his best, but he was just, quite frankly, outpitched by someone in Brandon Bailey who had himself perhaps the start of the summer. And, I mean, just to harp on that point, really, for Highness, you've had some special kids here when you talk about for Smelter. You've had probably some special connections, maybe. We talked about with this team the entire year. They've seemed from really the first week, they've seemed to make a quick connection with each other and you completely are amazed by having that connection with players that not many of them know each other. Maybe some are from similar schools or similar divisions, but not many kids know each other and to mesh like they did and to do as well as they did is a testament to manager Gassman and his staff to find those kids and bring them to Hyannis. And on the YD side of things, the MVP of the uh, playoff run will be Donnie Walton. I mean, who else better? He really came through in the most clutch of situations. The Cowboy from Oklahoma State, very well-deserved accolade as YD gets their awards here on the field. But just to touch on more highlights from the summer for Hyannis, Talk about this lineup. Talk about some interesting kids. Corey Bird, a playoff run to remember. This kid, fresh off of his freshman year at Marshall, impressed so many. Bobby Melly coming through in big spots, returning for two different stints here with Hyannis. And then you talk about guys like Jake Knoll, Austin Hayes, Jake Rogers who caught fire at the right time, even someone like Tristan Hildebrandt and Ryan Burke solidifying that bottom of the order through a deep run into the playoffs. Although the Harbor Hawks and Hyannis fans will have to wait at least one more year, quarter of a century without a title, the second longest streak next to the Falmouth Commodores in the Cape Cod Baseball League. It's really the players who made this season so fun to watch. Yeah, obviously you have to thank the players. They're the reason why we're up here. They're the reason why they made this season so successful for Hyannis and interesting to watch. And just to go on what Corey Burton, even other players on this team, when you talk about Smeltzer and Noel and guys like that, they're not they don't have the team capability to always make it to College World Series. Like you talk about kids from Vanderbilt, Virginia, and big schools like that, and Cal State Fullerton even. They don't have that ability when you talk about from Marshall and Florida Gulf Coast. For them to come up here and really show their stuff, that's what it's been all about, and good on them to be able to come in to these situations and prove themselves. And really for the relationship between interns and fans, People who live in Hyannis year in, year out, they buy into this team so much. And this was perhaps the deepest run that Hyannis has made in quite some time. Of course, everything seemed to be aligning in game one. Things fell apart in games two and three. But of course, for everyone tuning in, just understand the relationship that we have with all the townspeople here of Hyannis. These people work so hard. Everyone within the organization has done their due diligence and their part to make this season exactly what it was. It would not be possible without the help of Tino, the owner of the team, the president in uh, Brad, of course, Lori, the intern coordinator, John Cabral, who made you know broadcasting so simple, so flawless for us, to the assistant GM and the director of broadcasting operations. And, of course, all the interns who made things so fun, Sammy O'Brien, of course, with our interviews, Jeff with his antics, as well as Andrew Raby, our filmer, as we'll probably have one more Hawk Talk at the end of this. But, my goodness, it's a summer to remember, no doubt. It was definitely summer. Just everything you said, Chris, could not have been more perfect. There's no reason to repeat it. For everyone, we'd like to thank them, especially John Cabral, as people probably don't know how hard he – what he's done to get these broadcasts going on many of occasions. We've had issues. He's always been the guy to go to. He's always helped us out. A special thanks to him. And just thanks to everyone, the players, interns, everything for making it a special summer. And, of course, we have to thank anyone who's still listening in on this broadcast. To the parents of the, of the players, to the families of these kids that we watch every single day here for the past two and a half months to all of our friends and relatives loved ones back at home and anyone else in between who we have left out 
in terms of listening to our broadcast, you have no idea how much support we've gotten and how much it means to us that you have tuned in to us however many times it was throughout the summer. The reason Sammy, Gabe, and I have thrown on these headsets and spoken into mics for two, three hours at a time, day in and day out, is to entertain the fans at home, and we hope that we have done exactly that. Of course, it was never perfect through any single time, but every single time was a joy, an absolute pleasure, and we thank everyone for tuning in, and we just want you to know that we put in so much hard work to bring us this far into the summer, and Gabe, personal shout-out to you. Of course, brought you in under my wing from Rutgers University. I wish you nothing but the best as you head into your final two years at RU. Represent the Scarlet Knights very well as I go on to the future in what I hope to be a very successful career after Cape Cod. I will no doubt do that. Special thanks to you for showing me this league and just what it's capable of. And congratulations on your new job. And I hope we'll see each other again sooner or later. But have a good time in Oklahoma. Thank you, sir. As we will no doubt be connecting at some point, whether tonight or in the future. But Rutgers bloodline runs strong. Are you all the way? As we'll finally end things here from McKeon Park. A bittersweet ending, no doubt. An 8-1 victory for the YD Red Sox in the deciding game number three in the Cape Cod Baseball League Championship Series. Once again, thank you so much for everyone who made this season exactly what it was. A summer to remember here on Cape Cod for the final time. For Sammy O'Brien, Gabe Sustick, I'm Chris Morales. Donning the mics and saying farewell. It was a season to remember, a summer to remember. And we hope to see you next summer. 2016, the Hyannis Harbrocks will once again, no doubt, fly high. We hope you have a great rest of your evening and a great rest of your year.